On today's episode of The Unwritten Rule, we have more award season for Mizzou football. Uh, got some senior bowl nods, too, to talk about, um, as well as some uh, big Eli Drinkwitz Twitter news uh, and then some recruiting stuff, of course. Um, we'll have uh, the men's basketball recap later because, of course, this show's coming out on Thursday, like we announced for Thanksgiving. Um, so we'll recap that basketball, that men's basketball game against uh, South Carolina State down the or for the next show. Um, but we do have a little bit more basketball news. And then we have two great interviews. We talked to Porter Hayes of the Hog Talk podcast, um, previewed the Arkansas game with him. Great interview um, talking about the Razorbacks and where they've been at with their very disappointing season. Um, and then another super great inter- uh, interview with Barrett Bannister. We had him on third and Bannister himself. It was really great talking to him. He was in his car. Um, so we didn't want to keep him for too long. Um, and so that was a, that was kind of a funny time, but talk to us all about his career. Talk to him a bunch about Cody Schrader, um, a little bit about his, uh, his golf game and, uh, just his, his love for Mizzou. So great interview with Barrett. And then we will finish the show off with quick hits, um, to get you guys on your way for Thanksgiving and for the black Friday Mizzou game. So ton of, uh, exciting stuff to get into for the show and the unwritten rules presented. I bet online, bet online. The holiday season's off and rolling. Thanksgiving is today when you're listening to this. Um, NFL is in full stride and the NBA and NHL are hitting its season form. Love the NBA and season tournament. Uh, bet online is your number one destination for all your sports wagering info with up to minute sports wagering news, odds, trends, and predictions. Bet online is a top spot for everything in pro and amateur sports. It's not just the big four. Bet online has info available right at your fingertips on both desktop and mobile access at any time for almost any sport that is played from MMA to even international soccer. Love that. I uh, love betting on some, you know, Gibraltar France game. Bet the over France scored a lot of goals. Uh, so head to bet online today and remember to use our promo code believe B L E A V believe for your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit bet online where the game starts and the unwritten rule starts right now. I just, I, Marcel, where are you going with that disc? You are not putting that on again. Marcel, okay, if you press that button, you are in very, very big trouble. Attention, everybody stop what you're doing. It's time for The Unwritten Rule, a Mizzou sports podcast brought to you by the Believe Network, alongside Peyton Haverman and Kenny Van Doren. Here is your host, Jack Knowlton. Welcome back to the Unwritten Rule. Today is Thursday, November 23rd, and uh, happy Thanksgiving, Kenny and Peyton, uh, and to all the wonderful viewers out there. We're dropping this a day in advance because we have Mizzou football on Friday, um, so we just figured get the preview out. We did that with uh, Porter Hayes, so we'll get to that interview um, here shortly, but we do have some news and stuff. We recorded those interviews earlier in the week, so a bunch has happened. Um we have more more awards, which means once again my computer is running like a steam train while I have all these Twitter tabs open to read uh, the semifinalists and stuff. I'm sure I miss I'm missing some because there's still a bunch. Um, but award season for Mizzou football, Kenny and Peyton, Tyron Hopper, finalist for the Butt Kiss Award, um, Cody Schrader, semifinalist for the Doak Walker Award, um, Xavier Delgado, SEC Offensive Lineman of the Week. Um, Harrison Mevis, SEC Special Teams Player of the Week. Dog. Um, Brady Cook, Co-Offensive Player of the Week. And Luther Burden III, semifinalist for the Bolitnikov Award for the best uh, receiver in the country. There were some coaches ones, too. Um, it's Kevin Peoples, right, is the, for the, is the semifinalist for the Broyles. Yeah. Um, we'll get into the Senior Bowl in a second, but award season for Mizzou football. Yeah, um, this is a unbelievable crop uh, of awards that Mizzou is up for. Um, here's a good tweeze, uh, tweet rather uh, from Brendan Weiss on Twitter, bweiss16. is the at list of schools with semifinalists for the Davey O'Brien, top QB, Belitnikov, top wide receiver, and Dope Walker, top running back. Mizzou, that's it. That is the, Mizzou is the only school with finalists in all three of those awards. Alabama's not there, Ohio State, USC. That's just unbelievable to think about. I mean, and Mizzou football tweeted a graphic today. Mizzou has a 3,000-yard passer, 1,000-yard rusher, 1,000-yard rusher, 
uh, for just the fourth time in school history. I believe they're one of three. I can double check the stat on that. Uh, one of three in the nation that have that right now. Um, just been an unbelievable year. I wish I could touch on all of these. Uh, it's well-deserved in almost every case. I mean, it really, I can't think of anyone that I disagree with. It's funny though, too, because we talked about Xavier Delgado hasn't had a penalty in two years, and then is uh, then wins an award for this past week for how good he was on that offensive line, and for Hopper too, missing his first game of the season last week, and it kind of showed even people in the comments on YouTube agreed with us that when he's not on the field, even if like he's maybe makes a mistake with the missed tackle, like he he kind of struggled with earlier in the season, he's just such a leader and such you know such a force on that defense to get everyone going. And to be a Butkus finalist is amazing, too, just for a guy who just continues to stand out on this Mizzou team. Even entered, when we talked about during the offseason, he looked like he was probably the best guy on that defense, maybe even the best guy on the team. Yeah, I I think, like, if there was a game that proved just how vital Hopper is, if you didn't already you know, know or were convinced of that, it was last game. I mean, we talked about the linebacker play. Um, you know, credit to the backups where credit's due, but it will be very, very nice to have him back. And yeah, good for him to get some props, you know, here in the postseason. Who knows, you know, kind of where the future might uh, might hold for him. But yeah, it's just awesome to see these guys named. I know there was a a little bit of a confusion or people were, were wondering why it wasn't like Kirby Moore or Blake Baker who was up for that assistant award. And I actually didn't know this myself because Mizzou is only allowed to uh, to nominate one guy which I guess makes sense. That's like a, that'd be like a corner of the market situation. If you had a, if you're able to offer or, you know, offer up a, multiple people for that award, but yeah, I mean, big, big uh, congrats to all those guys. We'll see. Um, I think we're still thinking the most likely one is Cody Schrader with the walk on award, right? Definitely. Yeah. I mean, we touched yeah. on that with Barrett Bannister a lot. I think we, I, I can't imagine anyone else is really even up for it. I mean, that is, the season Cody Schrader has, uh, 1,100 rushing yards in the SEC is just insane. He's going to probably – it would take a miracle for him to not finish um, atop the conference in that statistic. So almost certainly he'll win that award. Yeah, definitely. Um, so things to keep an eye on. Other things, this is, this is always really cool. I know – you know, we like the senior bowl. It's a cool thing to see, you know, when you're looking at, at the next level, and especially for Mizzou, it's a chance for some of these guys to get showcased. Um, Ennis, Ennis Rakestraw invited, um, also invited to the East West Shrine Bowl. Um, and then Darius Robinson accepted his invitation, and so did uh, Cad, Chris Abrams Drain. So, you know, three guys with, I think, professional, I mean, at the very least, aspirations, but I know, you know, at least for Cad and, and Darius, and I think Ennis to some extent too, there's, you know, fairly early projections for all three of those guys, right? And then the Senior Bowl, you know, seems to help with that. Uh, it, Cad and um, D-Rob for sure definitely have those early projections. I really haven't seen a ton. There was that Matt Miller tweet about Ennis maybe being a first rounder. I just, I haven't seen that anywhere else, so I don't really know. I'm not a scout, so I'm not the most qualified to say that. They all look like pros to me, but uh, very cool to see them. We thought uh, D Rob was gonna go to this game last year potentially, uh, but that didn't wind up happening for the better uh, for Mizzou. That is, um, but yeah, really happy to see all three of them make it for the better of D Rob as well. Um, like we mentioned before, I mean, it makes all the sense in the world that like Kevin Peoples uh, was nominated amongst the Mizzou staff members. Putting D Rob on the on the edge. I mean, he's been incredible. He looks like a different animal. Looks more physical. Even like his physique, he looks just even more explosive. And um, when you think about who else could be from going to the Senior Bowl from this Tigers team, I think Javon Foster is still you know making a case. We know that he has um, top pick aspirations. He's going to go to the NFL as well. Um, he'd be the other guy that I would just kind of look out for, just see if there's going to be a post anytime soon for him. Yeah, so keep an eye on that. But another thing to look forward to um, after Mizzou season um, wraps up, see what kind of looks they get for the Senior Bowl. I know I, I've known we've known somebody for the last like three or four years that goes pretty much every year. Um, and we'll have we'll have our draft expert Jacob Infante on, you know, come draft time to kind of project those those guys um, for where they'll be in the pros. But yeah, 
plenty to keep an eye on as uh, as Mizzou's season rolls on for those individuals. Um, Cruton, we talked Cruton on Sunday, um, and it's still going. Um, we had a um, decommitment from Auburn, who is now locked in a Mizzou visit. Four-star running back Jamarion Burnett. Um, he will be visiting Mizzou from December 8th to 10th. Obviously, you know, it was committed to Auburn, um, but it is flip miss season. So is this another guy? And is there anyone else on drinks radar right now in kind of this weird part of the 2024 class where, you know, you have a lot of guys decommitting and an opportunity for some schools to maybe pounce on them? Yeah, this guy's been, I mean, Burnett has been just tweeting like M-I-Z after Mizzou wins and stuff. So he's definitely interested. Um, good to see him getting on campus. Uh, Mizzou needs definitely all hands on deck at running back uh, after this season. You're not going to have greater. Even your second string, who hasn't played a ton, but uh, Nate Pete, I mean, he'll be gone as well. Uh, so I would still expect Mizzou to hit the portal hard, but definitely good to get a four, another four-star in the mix. Uh, right now it would be between Tavares Jones, Jamal Roberts, um, probably a transfer and maybe Burnett can work his way into the mix for next season. One thing I have to add on the uh, recruiting front is some uh, fun actions from James Madison on X. Uh, James posted, stay home, fam. You see what we're doing over here. Where is better than your crib to put on? Hashtag M-I-Z. Uh, Williams, who is from Hannibal, Missouri, and one of the top running backs in um, the nation. And I think a lot of people might remind, remember Nash Williams. A lot of his tape is, I mean, incredible. He's just like, a, I mean, he was playing both ways at one point, um, playing some linebacker. And I mean, he's, he's been a force. Um, someone, a, another recruit named Deuce Knight, who's a Notre Dame quarterback commit, uh, replied with some laughing emojis and a thumbs down. James Madison quoted that with LOL at Anais Williams and with the number nine graphic from the college football playoff rankings. Pretty fun trolling there. And it's always cool to see James Madison still trying to recruit on his own. One thing I'll point out about James Madison that Peyton might not like is that James Madison's header is the same as Ish Burdine. Uh-oh. Uh, yeah, let's switch that up. Let's hope he he's what a did, little better than Ish Burdine. What did we do to deserve James Madison? <laughs> Truthfully. Recruit him. The, recruit him. Cruton. I, I have an idea, and you guys can boycott it. You can tell me that it's bad. Turn me down. I think we get rid of the Thomas Jefferson statue once and for all and put a James Madison one in oh. there instead. Agreed. Hot button issues. Prez. <laughs> it would, I mean, there would be Prez. two parties that would really like that as well. Not just football fans. There's other people in Missouri that probably don't want that statue there anymore. So let's get a James Madison one in there instead. Our James oh, yeah. Madison. I see your arguments. Prez, put it up. Um, yeah, that. You know, what What do we do to deserve him? Um, speaking of Drinkwitz, okay, I'll keep it a buck. I don't know what his old profile photo on Twitter was, but he has a new profile photo on Twitter. It's kind of funny we're talking about this. I said it as a joke, but I'm glad it's in here. Uh, this was big news to me. Um, Drink's old profile photo was a zoom in of just his face. Now it's like kind of a silhouette action, you know, kind of gives us the just us vibes more, you know, something to prove little bit like that mizzou's you know on the road the rogue path you know they're chomping in florida gators faces uh they're calling time out to ice tennessee's kicker up 29 it's just them drinks given the just them but i'm reading way too much into this i'm completely making this up but uh it just caught me off guard because he retweeted a bunch of things on sunday and i was like oh my gosh that's a new profile photo yeah, I guess I haven't replaced my profile photo in three years, so I guess it's I a haven't big either. Day. Yeah, so it'll remain the same. Well, congrats to Drink for that. Um, and then, like I said, men's basketball, they're playing. We're recording this on Wednesday. It'll come out Thursday. They play Wednesday evening, but we'll have that for Monday's show because um, we – or maybe, maybe if they lose by, like, 30, we'll hop on right after and talk about it and just be – vehemently angry for entertainment purposes um no i'm kidding but we'll have that game for Mo for monday show the news we can share though about basketball uh caleb brown he's out for the year he's being medically red shirted um after a stress fracture in his left shin uh i believe he's played less than five minutes has he played more than five minutes this year 
he played in two games. He played a, he played about a minute and a half against Memphis. Uh, didn't yeah. play too much against Pine Bluff. He was the most apparently the most improved player from the summertime, but uh, yeah, he's um, been given a rest for the. He's rest played of the thirteen total minutes this season: eleven there against Arkansas Pine Bluff, two against Memphis. Thank you, Kenny. Caleb uh, Brown, bummer, off of the year. Bummer for him. Um, I know Dennis said he was the most improved. I mean, he didn't really have a ton of time to show that. Um, it, it, Dennis has said a million times he's going to put. His players' future in front of like the now. That's just this kind of tracks with that. We remember last year Kobe against Alabama against in a big game against Alabama after he twisted his ankle against Arkansas. Dennis did not let Kobe go. He let him heal up. Um, so he walk, he he backs up what he says. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't think it, he was really ever going to crack the rotation to be honest, but. You know, yeah, definitely. Sorry. I mean, you don't want anyone getting hurt, but hopefully, you know, he can bounce back from it and whatever happens with his future remains to be seen. Um, gentlemen, any more quick, th- any more things you got on the brain before we hit our kick to our interviews? Yeah, I got one. We'll go back to the Twitter profile thing. It just popped in my mind. You don't want to be changing that profile pic too often because people might be thinking it's a fake Eli Drinkwitz, a fake Peyton Averman. Fake Jack mm. Nolan, you never know. I think that's why we don't change him as often. I've had the same one for two years now, and I'm too scared to change it. If someone makes a Jack, if some if some one makes a Jack Nolan burner, that's how I'll know I've made it. You know, like Gabe Matter. If we reach that status, you've got the unwritten rule burner. Um, that's how we know we've made it. Um, There's a high probability I, I will never change my Andy Dalton profile pick again. No, there is there is a good poss- you know probability um, because you lost a bet and you're going to lose this bet and you yeah have oh to my gosh yeah profile photo. we need to talk this about is... this yeah bring it up because... talk about it well, yeah wait okay so we have the bet Peyton Peyton me, made a bet off air Peyton made a bet off air related to Connor Tollison Mizzou's center um, maintaining a certain uh, grade on PFF for I think average. Just- at just an average grade on PFF and Kenny will find the grade, but he's maintained the grade. And it was also that Mizzou needs to get at least eight wins. Mizzou got its ninth win, of course, against Florida. Peyton needs to do his bet. He has been, uh, he has been sloughing on the bet. He said he would make a photo of Connor Wood and Mitchell Walters is header. That part is not happening. To do it. I'll, I'll, those two are not happening, but the Connor. No, 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 no. I don't know why you are protesting on that. That's like the least bad part of it. I'm going to read you the quote because you were okay. so confident in yourself. Tuesday, Oct- August 29th at 7.36 p.m. Central Time. I'll even one-up it. If Mizzou goes 8-4 and four and Tolleson grades out as an average center, I'll make him my profile picture and Mitch Walters and Connor Wood my header. You were so confident in yourself that you, you have said to that. I was it. very confident they were not that it was not going to happen. But, what? okay, so what was the grade? Um, his current grade... Right what now is a seventy six point six. What was the just whatever average is? I what, that's above average. What average is? I know that's above average, but do we know? Max what said is? Max said anything above seventy is like good. That's like a that's yeah. like a S, that's like a power five. Sixty five is the average. Is what yeah, you're sixty five. Yeah, sixty five. Okay. Well, we got two games left, so. And no wonder Cody Schrader gives this offensive line so much love. His run blocking grade is an eighty point five. No doubt, I, everybody go. on that old line has been very, very good. I have, I have no qualms with any of them, other than Connor Tolleson snapping. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's, that's not bad. a big part of his position. It doesn't matter. It has nothing to do. <laughs> you with need to what do the bet. About. You need to do the bet, Peyton. <laughs> or, well, or we leak, or we leak your other over. Twitter, or we leak your Twitter, other Twitter, and you have to tweet off of that for a month. Peyton is media only. Yeah. Okay, Peyton is media is my other Twitter. I had it for a class. You, well, you have to switch. You can only tweet off that for a month or do the original bet. Honestly, I, I still think you just have to do the original bet. How long do I have to have those two? A full year. Okay, no, not do it. Okay, full until year. until after until the, the next game. season. No, full until game. the next season starts. We got to make one for basketball, though. Oh yeah, we can make one for basketball. We'll figure it out. For a month after the bowl game. 
six weeks. <laughs> we'll figure it out. Very long um, amounts of time. I have I have one thing before we kick it to um our interviews. Peyton, you need to join me in a round of applause for our co-host Kenny Van Doren, who got a new who got a new gig. Congrats, Kenny. Everyone I applaud. lied. What if I lied to you guys? I don't actually have a new job, and I've Kenny, just been tweeting about new, nothing. Kenny got a new gig. Uh, now two out of the three unwritten rule cover other SEC programs in addition to Mizzou. Kenny, uh, I know I sprung this on you, but congratulations! I I felt one on the podcast was deserved. It's a much deserved position. Do you want to explain what you're doing, or do you want me to? I don't know. Um, yeah, I'm uh, covering re- football recruiting, basketball recruiting, anything else recruiting for LSU's Rivals page, Death Valley Insider. Um, I had one reply on my message board post, my intro, that said, at least you're not an Auburn Tiger. Welcome to the team. So I think that's where people <laughs> were okay that I went to Missouri and not Auburn. But I got to tell them, Auburn's a beautiful town. Oh, my God. He's, he spun that into Auburn's a great town. I can't believe this. You're unreal, but yeah, congratulations. Uh, well, obviously, you know, now we have a now we have a good beat of the SEC covered. And Peyton joked that he's going to now work for Auburn so that we can just like get all the rivalries uh, in the SEC West covered. But and then I'll trade it with Kenny yeah. since he loves Auburn. So yeah, and then he can move to Auburn and live in his double decker Whataburger. Um, but congrats, Kenny. Uh, you know, everyone, if. You know, you're a, maybe an LSU fan or whatever. Go subscribe. But with that, uh, we'll kick it to ourselves. We're going to talk with Porter Hayes. We'll preview the Arkansas game uh, with him, and then we'll have Barrett Bannister later on and finish up with quick hits. So, um, yeah, stay tuned. Enjoy the interviews. Okay, we now welcome on a very special guest. We have to preview the big one, the rivalry game, Mizzou versus Arkansas. Um, so we're doing another another cross-believe network guest. We've, de- we've had a streak of that going for the last couple of Mizzou games. Um, so we have Porter Hayes of the Hog Talk podcast on. Um, Porter, thank you so much for joining us. You might have the best setup behind you of anyone we've had on so far in terms of like merch and memorabilia. I got a blank wall behind me, but um, thank you for joining. And, uh, you know, quick thoughts on the game, a little bit about yourself and just welcome to the show. I oh, appreciate it. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm glad y'all said y'all y'all see is a rivalry. Uh, that is a hot topic down here in Arkansas. And I think <laughs> it's a lot of uh, um, denial. From a lot of people, you know, they they think that that they're. I mean, I'm just going to shoot it straight. There's a lot of people who think they're above Missouri when it comes to the pro the, the rivalry and stuff. But when you have only won three games since in, since the 2000s, you can't really say that you're the big brother of this rivalry. But it is a rivalry, and and you can. Um, I'm going to butcher his last name, Basil. 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 Yeah, Basil. Oh, yeah, it started with him when he when he started. And he talked trash, and then he backed it up. When you want to beat another team just as much as they want to beat you, it is a rivalry. I don't care how you want to cut it, slice it. So this is a rivalry. Um, Down here in Arkansas, we made the trophy, so it was like forced. To a lot of fans, that a lot of people thought it was a forced rivalry, but then it started becoming a rivalry, and I think a lot more people are starting to align with with that. But, uh, yeah, been doing the podcast here for going on. This is my fifth year. I don't want to confuse a lot of people. You see Clemson and Arkansas. I am a Clemson Tiger fan, but I also love women's basketball. I'm a huge, my dad lived in Yukon in the nineties. So I got to see the Yukon Tennessee rivalry oh, cool. in the, in the heyday. So you see a lot of things. And then plus I got to represent my high school, the Ozark Hillbillies. So um, <laughs> as I told you all about that the other day, so a, a big smorgasbord going on back there. That's electric. I do. We love it. I do have to correct myself. I said Basilac. I don't know why I thought it was Basilac. It was Eric Beisel. Beisel. Um, yes. The, yes. Yeah. Basil the linebacker. The yeah. And Beisel okay. was the one that said yeah, Arkansas and right. all that. Yeah. yeah. It's easy to get them names switched up. Mm-hmm. I was about to say, I don't think I've ever heard Basilac say anything interesting anything. or important ever. Um, it's been a while <laughs> since we've heard, heard it. I'm not trying to diss him. He was just a pretty yeah. straightforward guy. Um, but yeah, I'm glad you started there with the rivalry because I want to know, like, maybe just a quick thing here. Why do Arkansas fans really just think that they're above Mizzou? I mean, you look at the rivalry, it's 10 to four. Mizzou has 10 wins in 14 meetings. I, I just don't know where Arkansas thinks that they are the better overall program. You you got to look at who one of the, the 
Mount Rushmore of people are when it comes to the Arkansas Razorbacks, and that's Jerry Jones. Look, look at how he is with the Dallas Cowboys. I mean, it's always going to be next year. It's going to be their year. It's going to be their year. They're they're and they missed. The, you know, they haven't won the Super Bowl since '95, I believe. Look at Arkansas in basketball. They haven't won a national championships since '94. It, it's the same kind of thing. You know, it's Arkansas is a very good program. We're very good in a lot of sports, and we're blessed to be good at football, basketball, and baseball. But the expectations of the program compared to the last, I mean, since Bobby Petrino has been very lackluster, and you can see it. I mean, Arkansas has won twice, you know, since uh, Missouri's been in the um, SEC. And really, I mean, it was a lopsided win there. And then, of course, you know, Columbia in Columbia in 18, 30 and nothing. But other than that, the games have been really close. But I think a lot of it, like I said, is denial. A lot of people are just don't want to say that it's a a rivalry because, look, they want to say that LSU's their rival when LSU looks at Arkansas kind of like how a majority of the Arkansas fans see Missouri. And you could take the win-loss record away. And yes, it's 10-4, but it's just a lot of perception. Yeah, that's – I, I want to you, – you touched on the expectations really since Petrino, um, and I think that's a fair point to make because, I mean, really since Mizzou even joined the SEC, it was almost – obviously it's not correlated, but it happened almost right as Missouri joined the SEC. Arkansas has had a lot of down years. Um, this is another one where, I mean, nobody I think really expected Arkansas to be 4-7 and seven going into this game. And a lot of people thought Pittman uh, was maybe on his way out. Um, but the, the AD, I mean, he confirmed he'll be back for 2024. I know a lot of Razorbacks fans were not happy. Um, I want to know your take on Sam Pittman, him coming back, and maybe the expectations being a little too great for what the program is right now. Well, I don't, I don't think it's the, the, pro, the expectations for what I have for this program. I, we've been asked this, you know, on Twitter all last week. You know, I think this is – a you should be bowl eligible every year. That that's my expectations for this program. Six, seven wins. That's not a lot of ask when you have four non-cons and then the SEC schedule. Now I know that's going to change with the new outlook of the SEC and no more divisions and stuff like that. But there still should be no reason how this program can't win three. I mean, I said it. You three to four of your non-conference wins, I expect. Because I want you to play a tough non-conference opponent that could beat you. You don't want to play four cupcakes, and then you go play this gauntlet of an SEC schedule, and then you're doomed. Look what's happened. Ever since, you know, they'll play a week non-con, you lose the Texas A&M game, but you look at this this year's schedule. Name another team, and this is no excuse for their record, but name another team that will go to LSU. Your game at Texas A&M is always in Arlington, so you're on the road at a and you're on the road at LSU, you're on the road against A&M, you're on the road at Ole Miss, and then you're on the road at Alabama. Name another school that could come out of that undefeated or win two of those games. Maybe Georgia. Maybe. But other than that, there's no other school really in the country that could sit there and run that gauntlet and and come out with no losses. But that's been Arkansas's schedule every single year. And then, you know, you're playing a Little Rock game along with an Arlington game. So now there's two games you're losing where you don't get to recruit. You don't get to have recruits on campus, which the Arkansas Little Rock thing is going to be going away, and the Texas A&M Arkansas game in Arlington is going away. So it's going to be a more home-and-home home feel now, and it's going to help out. But, yeah, it, it, it's tough when you have – I had this as a nine-win season. When you say you've got one of the best quarterback running back duos in the country back, and K.J. Jefferson, Rock, you know, Raheem Sanders, Rocket Sanders – then he gets hurt, and then, of course, you lose the game to BYU, and it was like you're blowing up this balloon and then pop, and it just went downhill from there. I mean, you know, and then you lose a game like you did against Mississippi State, and then you win a game against Florida, where, and you thought, okay, you get rid of Dan Enos, you give Kenny Guyton the calls, you beat Florida in the swamp, which you've never done, and then you just totally lay an egg against Auburn. But that's Arkansas' season every year. It's a roller coaster, and – and I will say this, and again, not it's saying it's an excuse, and I'm not saying Missouri wouldn't win more of these games, but just how this schedule and the depth and what Arkansas had to do coming out of the West, I think it would be a little bit more even of 
if this game was played maybe in the earlier part or the middle part of the, the, the schedule. Playing this at the end of the year has really benefited Missouri in, in this rivalry. Yeah, that's a that you know I didn't I didn't think about that especially with the neutral like the two neutral site games and that taking away from the the chance to play at home. I mean, what what were you maybe expecting like you know if you didn't think you know the season was going to go as as topsy turvy as it did or Rocket Sanders doesn't get hurt? I mean, you know, do you did you think Arkansas gets to that two wins in that stretch of like LSU A and M and say the BYU game goes your way as well? You know, were you feeling that it was going to be maybe only a two loss team heading into that Mississippi state game. Yes. And, and I said below because Arkansas has always played LSU tough. I mean, Arkansas and LSU is, is a close game. And back when they used to play in Little Rock, I mean, Arkansas beat LSU twice. And one time they beat LSU and they ended up winning a national championship. You know, but you go back to the Darren McFadden days when, when all mm-hmm. that happened, but you, even this year, you lost that one 34, 31. I mean, that's how close this series is. And then you had the Texas A&M game. My thought going into this season was you're playing the LSU game before the – or that you're playing the LSU game before the AM game. That AM game is just exactly like the Missouri game on the opposite end of the, the schedule. You just always – you can't seem to get that win over a team that you're even with where you should be 50-50 split with. So I was like, okay, they, they play LSU tough or they get the win – and then they go through, but that of course is saying they beat BYU. Mm-hmm. You have that game against BYU, you lose that one 38 31, and then it just steamrolled from there. You know, you lose the inning game 34 22. And I'll say this that game was 34 22, but AM dominated that game. They that, that game and the Auburn game was the only two games where Arkansas, I felt, just got dominated. And then you have the pillow fight against Mississippi State seven and three, but. You flip those games. I mean, there was one point Arkansas could have been seven and one. Uh, there's a guy that comes out. Um, I can't remember his name offhand. He's on Twitter, and he'll uh, say if the one score or one possession games were flipped the other oh, yeah. way, you have this record. And I think Arkansas was like third in the nation. Like, if you were to rank them, they'd be third in the nation and only have one loss. Right. It's just been the type of year Arkansas's had. That's that's a that was a big thing with Mizzou. Like I think a, a year or two ago, they had the same thing where it was just these one score games, this frustrating schedule. That's just kind of the, you know, we talked about this. You know, we were we were gonna maybe touch on basketball at the end of this, but that's where you know in football you have no room for error. Like yeah. one loss in November or even for B, like in the BYU game in September, you know, your season can kind of spiral from there. It gets tricky. Yeah, and I'm sure you know, and that's if you're always having those national championship aspirations it's yeah. over you know and and you see how tough the sec is you can lose one game and still make it to the college football playoff you could lose two games and still make it to a new year's six bowl i mean that's that is the gauntlet and again you just look at the schedule that they had lsu AM, Ole Miss, alabama of course mississippi state but then you still had florida auburn and then now the finish up that you were playing the number 10 team in the country in missouri and which I, I really want to say both of your losses were by a field goal or, or less, I want to say. LSU I- wound up being 10, but it was Brady Cook through a pick six with 45 seconds left. Okay. Yeah. I knew they were close. I, I knew that – because I knew that – well, even the Georgia game was really close too, correct? Yep. Yeah. It was okay. nine, but nine. That, again, that just got away at the end. But you yeah. see the, the comparisons when we make – Flip these games. I mean, Missouri could be undefeated right now. I mean, theoretically, you could be. Um, that's just the type of season and what Drinks had. I mean, Drink, I mean, and that's another thing backing up to the rivalry. He's from Arkansas. He's got those Arkansas ties. There was a lot of people who were uh, kind of upset when there was, you know, I don't know if it's true or what, saying, "Hey, we want you to come be the coach at Arkansas," and he he turned it down. So again, it goes to that bad blood of these stories you hear of. We think we're better than Missouri, but does he think he's better than Arkansas? It's just those things that adds fuel to the fire. Yeah. There, there were some uh, some funny posts, too, from, like, message boards, like, rivals message boards, pictures of him. It was like, would you go after Drinkwitz if you could? Like, I don't think Drinkwitz is leaving for this job. Um, there was also some worries, like, a year ago that maybe he'd leave for Auburn because he also has a really strong Auburn tie. That's where he started. Um, but, yeah, getting more into this, this preview – 
Um, you mentioned Rocket Sanders not having the season with a couple setbacks there. Now we know he's out for the remainder of the season. Another running back with another season-ending injury. Um, what can you tell us about the run game for this last week for the Razorbacks? Oh, man, that's tough because the offensive line's been atrocious. I mean, it's been a lot of it is when, you know, somebody just sparks. Dominique Johnson last week and Isaiah Gustav come out and just broke out. Now, again, we're, we're talking about Florida International, one of the worst teams in their conference. Um, but when, when it's come down to it, you look at the Florida game, KJ Jefferson really in that game, put that team on his back and he's been really the dual threat. He's the leading rusher on the team with 432 yards rushing. So if you want to really look at, if you want to really have the chance where you really want to shut Arkansas down, that's the guy you shut down. Uh, I know with his throwing ability and running ability, it's going to be, it's going to be a task. But with, with Arkansas and only scoring, I think, 29 points a game average is, is their average. Um, they're, they've only – their leading res, uh, receivers, Andrew Armstrong, with 724 yards. So you take out Dominion and Sanders, you still have A.J. Green with 325 yards. So you got A.J. Green still, shifty back. It, it's kind of like you got Dominique Johnson and Isaiah Gustav. They're your bell cows. And then A.J. Green is very shifty – and one of those kind of like Schrader is, you know, just that shifty back when you need somebody to really get through a hole. And um, yeah, you touched on it there. I mean, the, the guy to stop if you're the Missouri defense has got to be KJ Jefferson. Uh, the offensive struggles from earlier in the year, obviously well documented. Dan Enos didn't even last the full season. Um, and Arkansas really, I mean, it's just kind of been a down year for the offense across the board. Jefferson still has had a decent year. Um, what has really, when Arkansas has struggled on offense, what have what has really been the key to stopping uh, KJ Jefferson? You you really just got to confuse him because let's let's be honest. Um, when Browse was here, you know he kind of had to go to a one or two read system for KJ. Enos didn't work out because he was more in the NFL pro style offensive coordinator. And I don't care if you, if you're Bill Belichick, if you, it's not working for this system and, and or the team's not picking up what you're throwing down, it's not a good fit. So you come with Kenny Guyton plant and doing the play calling, reduce the play book by 30% and go back to your more of your one, two reads. And I'll tell you what, even in the college game and the RPO system, it's hard to do an RPO and then a three read or read check down because it's just you think of an NFL average. Me and my co host Adam were talking and pulled up a stat in the NFL. And I think you had on average two to three seconds before you had to release the ball. Yeah. Before you get sacked. So you think about having to do an RPO or one two read in an SEC defense week in and week out. That That's about what you need. So if you can key on pretty much his go-to guys, that's where people have been taking advantage of the struggles. Also with the offensive line, when you surround KJ and he either passes it or he comes back up the middle, that's all he's had to do. Like he's not been able to get out in the pocket. Now, if you can keep him from rolling out the pocket, you have a really good chance of stopping him. Yeah. I, that, I mean, you know, KJ Jefferson's a guy like even Eli Drinkwitz has joked, like, you know, I feel like we face this guy. He's given us nightmares. Um, you know, every year we've played him, he's been there forever. I even remember, I think for that Alabama game, Nick Saban said the same thing and gave him a lot of praise. I know you guys talked about him and that's one of, you know, the way you guys put it is Arkansas is a, a lot of things they have to figure out this off season. And, and he seems to be one of them. So I want to broaden that out. Like, you know, what is kind of the the future with him look like? I mean, does it is it is it kind of the vibe that fans I'm sure they want him back with all the stuff he's done. He obviously could test the NFL waters. You know, he could come back like what's what's kind of, the you know, it seems like what what what's the trend? I guess it seems like it kind of is going toward with him. You, you know, with with how his status is here at Arkansas and you know how the NIL has changed everything when it comes to, you know, players. You look at his draft status, and even beginning of the season, he was like rated as like the 13th or 14th rated quarterback in, in the country. Okay. That that's undraftable. So 
you're looking at someone who's projected NIL worth is 500,000. So you're just looking at, he's, he hasn't been injured. You know, he's been pretty much healthy this year. And then you see the things like with, with Dan Enos not working out. You know, this is your last hoorah. You're at the top of every record. And this is what me and Adam talked about on the show. Ha have you done enough at Arkansas to where all right, you have nothing left to prove? Or do you want to try to come and rewrite that book of going out your last season at an at a 8, 7, 8, make your bowl game in your last season at Arkansas? That's a tough back. So it just depends on if he wants to come back, get some more NIL money, go out where he solidifies himself on top as the definite best quarterback to come out of Arkansas. Or has he done enough to where he's like, I'm just going to go either to another team or I'm going to go to the NFL. Yeah. I know he's a, he's a different style quarterback, but I mean, on the level of like, you know, talking about greatness record books, I mean, it was the last like real, like dominant quarterback. I mean, I, I guess he's not in the, the same year that he did last year, but it was Ryan Mallett, probably that last guy at Arkansas that really was turning heads like this yes. for pros. Well, this was the last quarter that's, you know, four years, you know, because you had Mallet, and then you had Tyler Wilson, and then you had Brandon Allen, Austin Allen, and then you had uh, your KJ Jefferson. You know, there, there's really not been somebody who's – you've got to go back to way back to Clint Stoner that has been – a four-year guy because Ryan Mallett wasn't even a four-year guy. You know, he come in two seasons for, from Michigan, but he's a Texarkana guy, you know. So, yeah, when it comes to – you look at the folklore and the legends that come out of Arkansas. I mean, you got Darren McFadden and then you got Ryan Mallett. You know, when it comes to those – yes, Alex Collins, you know, rest in peace to him and Mallett, you know. But that's what has really lacked Arkansas is just that superstar. You know, when you it, it, it to me, I've done this five years, but I've been a Razorback fan for 40 years. And it's like we have to go back to Mallet. We have to go to back to Darren McFadden to relive those glory days. I mean, they're doing a special right now on the 94 championship Razorback team when they beat Duke. I mean, we have a lot of success with Musselman, but when it comes to that glory, baseball's about it when you're talking about being able to go to the college world series. I mean, you have Yes, you're going to the lead eight, but when it comes to that top dog status, it's you have to go back 10, 15 years to talk about that. I have another question here about, you know, you talked a little bit about the recruiting, you know, where you're going to play. And I know that last year, Arkansas was in a couple like recruiting battles almost with some guys that are entering the portal with Missouri. And one of them was Andrew Armstrong, who was a wide receiver from a smaller school in Texas. And when I was, you know, talking to him at the time, I was on the football beat. You know, he had he was going to go and visit Mizzou, Arkansas, you know, just changed his mind after the visit to Arkansas. He's, he was going to go there. Another guy that comes to mind is Trey John Jeffcoat, former Mizzou edge now at Arkansas. I mean, looking at their stats, especially for Jeffcoat, just hasn't been a good year. I mean, what can you kind of say about the guys that they brought in from uh, last season? That's where, you know, look, this ain't like basketball where you can rely on transfer guys to make a big difference in your team. I mean, Arkansas has done that. Felipe Franks was really the one that come in and really kind of got that foundation and set that nine win season for Arkansas. You know, now you've got a guy like uh, <clears throat> Landon Johnson. You've got guys like Jaden Wilson. You look at last last year in Hazelwood. You know, we've had those two or three guys that have come in and done really good out of the portal. And this year, I mean, I know he's not stat wise got a lot of you know the stats but jeff coat is he's a beast you know he's very he's done really really good when it comes to being being a force along with paul who paul but yes you know andrew armstrong's been that guy to go to and when it comes to injuries when you lose to your top tight ends you look luke has there to, i mean the very first drive against a m a game that we needed to win and Loose. I mean, that's that was a freshman, but he was a legitimate threat. Like he would he would have been a freshman All American, no matter what. And then, of course, when you lose Ty Washington, you lose your two top ten got two tight end guys on the same injury at the same critical first drive of their respective games. So, but yes, uh, you know Armstrong and Jeff Coat have done really good for Arkansas. And yes, the the that's when you know it's really deep. 
is when you're in the crew recruiting battle and you're seeing guys and it don't matter what sport, basketball, football, baseball, if anybody's looking at Arkansas and they flip to Missouri, it's a big deal. I mean, that that's when you know the rivalry is real when you're looking at recruits and if they flip to Arkansas, it's automatically, ah, oh, we didn't them anyway. I mean, that's just, they're always a five star till they choose the other school and then, ah, that, we're we're good without him, you know. It's just how it is. Uh, you touched on Jeff Coat there a little bit. I want to stay on that side of the ball. Um, Arkansas's defense has been kind of up and down this year. Um, I know Dwight McLaughlin. I mean, he's one of the best corners in the nation. Um, but maybe who are some other playmakers to watch out for on that defense? And what are maybe your expectations going uh, up against a pretty good Mizzou offense? If you got guys that like McLaughlin, then this is this is I'm not gonna say Arkansas is gonna win at this point. I'm not gonna make a prediction. I'm saying if if Arkansas is gonna win this game, you gotta have your guys like Dwight McLaughlin. You gotta have guys like Walcott. Both of the games where they had the interception, they ripped the ball out of the guy's hand. Like you got to come and want it. And I've said this out and I've called the defense out a couple of times during the season. It's like they're waiting for the play to come to them and they don't want to go to the play. Like when, when you you're giving and and when you're dealing with SEC or any D one really you're giving somebody an extra three to four yards when you don't want to pursue you're sitting there and, and just in a stance waiting on them to come to you but you got to because this is Arkansas's bowl game this is what is going to be scary when it comes for Missouri looking at this Arkansas game is one you're playing at Razorback Stadium but two this is Arkansas's bowl game this is it for and this is if KJ decides not to come back. Rocket Sanders, of course, he's out. He, you know what I'm saying? Like, so there's a lot of guys that a lot of jokes were made about. Hey, this is pride from here on out because there's not a bowl game, but this is their bowl game. Um, we've seen them play up with Alabama. We've seen them play up against LSU. They have the ability to play with Missouri. It just depends on what team you're going to get on Friday, if that happens or not. But when it comes to that, defensive side of the ball you have to stop Schrader you ha you cannot let because you know Missouri's going to pick you apart through the year I mean you've just done a really good job when it comes to the, the offensive passing game and your receiver but you can't let Schrader get 150 and you can't let a guy have 150 yards receiving on you if Missouri has 300 yards passing and 150 yards rushing by, by Schrader it, it, it's going to be a blowout. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad you said the thing about like, because I, I feel like I always maintain sometimes the most dangerous team to play is a team playing for nothing other than pride. And, you know, because they can just kind of go out and let it all on the line. And you mentioned the implications with KJ and stuff. So I think that's a good point there. Is this team still number one in the country in a defensive touchdowns? That I don't know. I, I, I don't think so now because, I mean, that, that game, I don't know where they're ranked defensively wise but that game against Auburn just really just I mean you you get stuck when when you got a guy Fletcher's been on and off I mean there's been games where Max Fletcher our punters can boot it 70 yards really flip the field one game and then games where half of them he shanks yeah Cam Little missed two field goals against FIU so when you when you're going threeing out and then you punt it and you're not able to flip the field you're, you're putting your defense in a bad position. And then they get wore down, and then you see in the second half where they just get gassed. And, you know, Arkansas was lucky against FIU and went 24 unanswered points to make it to, uh, to – because when it, I was at the game and when FIU went up 13-7, I was like, oh, you know, here could this be it? You know, we were thinking, mm -hmm. could this be the last game? It was like a Western Kentucky-type game when Chad Morris was here. But then Arkansas finally got it together – and pulled out the win. I looked it up. They are uh, tied for first with Michigan and Washington. They have five. So it like, that's always something interesting. I know sometimes that can just be like a, a fortunate, you know, you get yeah. a pick six, you have an open lane when you pick it off, but it sounds like, you know, these, these defenders are pretty aggressive. And, and I know you talked about Schrader on your podcast too. Um, you know, I, I, I want to flip on the Arkansas side of the ball. I mean, who should Missouri fans, is it truly, you know, primarily KJ that Missouri fans should say like, you have to make him panic. You have to make him make decisions. And it seems like from what you're saying, you know, Missouri's defense has a decent chance of doing that given the O-line, you know, around him. 
Yeah, and, you know, and I, again, I've, I've made a couple of basketball references to this game, but it, yeah. it's almost like that one guy where you know, okay, he's going to get his 20. We'll let him have his. If you shut KJ down, I mean, you, you that's the ball game. I mean, because like I said, say AJ Green does go off for 100 yards. I mean, really, you're going to have to have a guy that goes for 204 touchdowns. You're going to have to have that guy that just lucky break gets a couple of receiving touchdowns and goes off for 150, 200 yards receiving. I mean, that's what it's going to take for Arkansas to win. I mean, we're going to have to get some lucky breaks and we're going to have to come out and really hit Missouri in the mouth and be like, okay, we want this game more than Missouri. Missouri's struggled in some games. Arkansas has struggled in some games. Well, I mean, this is, yeah, the, the record that Arkansas has at four and seven, trying to get five and seven, it seems doom and gloom. But Arkansas has the talent. Do they have the will to pull this game out? On the defensive side of the ball again, um, big name that like, I always kept hearing last year, and I think it was just because it was such an interest, inter- interesting name was Bumper Pool. I know he's gone now, and he was just he was like the epitome of an Arkansas Razorback there for was it like five or six years? He was your Barrett Bannister on defense. Um, who is like the guys like on that defense? They're just dogs, like ones that like if you're gonna see that number, you're gonna be like, oh, he's gonna hit them hard. You know, Poopal, uh, Chris Paul, Jaheim Thomas is another one. Walcott has really come on. I mean, McLaughlin. I mean, you get these guys, Jeff Coat. You get guys that I mean, all it takes is you know each one of these guys to make a play, get a turnover. I mean, you two three turnovers. This is a different game. You know, the, but all those guys you hear their name. All the time, Jeff Coat, McLaughlin. Then, of course, you know, I know Hudson Clark's been a name because he's been there forever. He he was a walk on that got a scholarship because I believe is after the Ole Miss game he had three interceptions. And if he stays in his little zone, he's okay. But he's been burned a lot. Uh, look back at that score against FIU. And instead of cutting in front of the guy, try to play on the ball, he comes behind him and it's a touchdown. I mean, it's just things like that. Eric Gregory is another name. Cameron Ball. We have a lot of talent on the defensive side of the ball. And back to that where you're talking about the defensive touchdowns, a lot of that was inflated because at the first three or four games, I think they had five or six takeaways just in the first Mm -hmm. couple of games um, on that. But, yeah, they're ball hawks, and it's one of them that if you have the receivers, they better hold on to the ball after the catch because we're going to try to, I mean, rip the ball out. I want to go back, kind of look at the bigger picture for Arkansas, because obviously it is a bit of a lost season at this point. No, no, not even so much as a bowl game, really. Um, but in the future, I mean, Sam Pittman's back. I mean, he's going to have another chance. Um, what do you think? Obviously, they're going to need a new OC. They botched uh, the hire with Danny you know, uh, last time. I'm sure that'll be a priority for them. But what else needs to be done to kind of ensure that a year like this doesn't happen for Arkansas again? Well, they started a little bit. I mean, one, um, Sam Pittman's addressed NIL. One, we need to get more. I mean, look, it's sad when you brag as a whole university that you are you hit a million dollars on your NIL. I mean, there's people who are getting a million dollars by yeah, themselves. There are female athletes getting a million dollars by themselves, first and foremost. Second thing, they got our transfer from Michigan State. He went JUCO. Now he's offensive lineman, former four-star. The the names got away from me. But um, they're starting to make some things. But, look, it, it's not all roses. Um, you know, you're, you're looking at do, do we want to buy out or do we want to try to put in money to the NIL? Do we promote Kenny Guyton next year to OC because – do we want to buy out Pittman or do we want to buy out Pittman and an OC? I mean, there's so many questions. Who's coming back now? Jacoby Criswell, backup quarterback, he can spin it. I'm very confident in the fact that if they do, you know, KJ indeed goes elsewhere, whether it be pro or transfer porter or, or whatever, Jacoby Criswell is, is going to be a good replacement for him. Now he's going to need some time to really, you know, develop as a starter. But, yes, going into this next season, I mean, we're not even done with this one, but you can already tell this is going to be the season with the most questions coming into next year. OC, what what are you going to do with your offensive line? Do you keep your offensive line coach? Because he's been getting a lot of criticism. Um, 
I think if you improve, if you double your offensive line talent, this is a six, seven win team. I mean, just because you've given KJ the time, you're giving your receivers time to get open, but yet that's another thing that needs to be addressed. You're going to have to up your receiver game because, yes, you have speed, but there's no separation. You just look at the receivers. They're not allowed to get any – they're not quick enough to get any kind of separation. So O-line, NIL, and get a couple more receivers, this team could be – enough to where we're looking at okay sam's got this thing under control let's ride with it. yeah yeah this is what that's one thing like i i'm grateful that missouri passed they have their like recruiting nil law where you can start to do those deals before they even have recruits on campus that's something like we've noticed has helped um you know just with the the movement of nil for them um but that's yeah that's an interesting like conundrum i do want to ask getting back to kind of the lore of this rivalry i know like um, I saw some stuff on Twitter about, and I think you mentioned it too, about how like Mizzou fans want to go down to Fayetteville and do the tiger stripe and bring all that out. Um, you know, I, I guess just, you know, one, one more quick summary from you in terms of like what Arkansas fans are seeing from this game, maybe some stuff you saw from Mizzou fans that, you know, have just caused a going back and forth or an eruption on the Arkansas side of things. Man, it's like it's like I said, man. You're kicking a dog wise down. You know, it's like it's like you you know we're not going to a bowl game. You know it's a rivalry. You know we're, we're coming off bragging about a win over FIU, and it's like you you hear the things about Sam Pittman can possibly be gone. Is he coming back? And then the the running joke of let's go down and do a stripe out on Arkansas's field. It's it's almost like beating it. You know, it's just like I said, kicking a dog wise down, and <laughs> you know. We, because we know it's like we can't say anything about it. It's like you're getting punched in the face with your arms tied behind your back. You know, when it's 10 4 and you yeah. again, you know, you've only won two of these games since the SEC, you got to sit there and take it. Uh, I believe, uh, I can't remember who tweet. I know it was Drink was in it and it was a tweet about a, a dinner or something. And there was a Razorback with an apple in its mouth or something preseason or something. I think they had a team meeting. It was. Or it was like a booster event or something like that, yeah. and it was after they had gotten Brian Huff from Arkansas yes. uh, to commit to them. And I seen that, and like we can't be mad at it because one, we <laughs> would do the same thing if roles were reversed, but we can't be mad at it because we can't say we got to win. Yeah, and look, you can't go to any other. You can't go to any other sport. You, I mean, when it comes to football, when you deflect from that conversation, you've lost the battle. Yeah, when that's basketball. When you bring up track and when you <laughs> say, well, you haven't done this. When the conversation's football and you're bringing up other sports, you've lost. Now, if we're talking about basketball, can't touch us in basketball. All right. But if it's a basketball conversation and then you bring up football, y'all have lost the battle. I mean, that's just how I see. I don't like the deflection because you're waving the white flag. Okay, see, I'm glad you said that because we saw some stuff on Twitter that there were Arkansas fans that that's what they were doing. It was like, it was like, let's look at how much of a poverty sport or athletics program Missouri is. And there wasn't one football thing about that. I'm like, yeah. come on, guys. So I'm the glad. The only thing I'll say is like, that take you know, when, when Missouri fans, they'll, they'll talk about, well, Arkansas is a track and field school. <laughs> when we look at the SEC championships that Missouri has, there's two in volleyball. Yeah. So that's what we laugh about. It's like, okay, I mean, I know you got us in football. I know you've got two SEC appearances, you know, two championship games appearances, but you can't throw in, well, y'all have got all these track when y'all's only two SEC titles were. Uh, now, there was something about SEC don't do wrestling. So if SEC <laughs> wrestling, y'all would be a wrestling school. It's so yeah, um, wrestling school. you got to give us that. But yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's my viewpoint on it. That's a banners fly forever. That's I mean, <laughs> that's what that's what matters. We also like yeah, a lot of people like to cope as well, getting into that stuff. And uh, you, Trayvon Brazil gets brought up all the time. Like, oh, we took Trayvon Brazil. Now he's good. Now he's actually playing a lot more. You guys don't have Conzo Martin anymore. And then new one is Ross Lovich. I mean, the Arkansas baseball, that class is going to be incredible already um, for yeah. this next Ty season. Wilms so many things too. you could point to. Yeah. Uh, take time. Ty Wilmsmeyer is the other one, too. Mm -hmm. um, just taking a lot of those guys. Uh, but I got another thing here, just a fun question. Looking in the back, we talked about it as well. You're a Clemson guy. Mizzou has some uh, ties to Clemson. Uh, Kelly Bryant, not too long ago, was yep. Missouri, Missouri Missouri's quarterback. Didn't play What's Arkansas. 
I was happy for yeah. him. I love, look, my cousin, it's, it's funny you say that my cousins went to school, high school with him. Uh, he went to Wren high school right down the road where I was. I mean, so I lived 10 summers out in Greenville, South Carolina. We're 20 minutes from campus. Wren's right there, 10, 15 minutes away from campus. Kelly Bryant's a good dude. Um, you got to think, look at Kelly Bryant and you put him in the same aspect of Bryce Young. You have all this, all these winning. You got Deshaun Watson and then Trevor Lawrence. You're sandwiched in the middle of those two. There was the pressure of him being that next guy, especially with Clemson never winning a national championship. Then you win. You expect him to come in and just be Deshaun Watson. He wasn't, but he was still a good quarterback. And there was a lot of Arkansas fans that wanted I wanted him to come to Arkansas because he was a Clemson guy. We ended up getting Xavier Kelly. He was a guy from Clemson and come played for Arkansas. But, yeah, I was really happy for him to, to be able to go to Missouri, and I was even going to try to go to that game in Little Rock, but I, I didn't get to get down there. But, yeah, I, I was really happy for him to be able to uh, get to Missouri after Clemson. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was cool to see him. That was a big bragging right. So that was our – so we like just graduated from Missouri. And so he like announced that he was going there right before our freshman year there in 2019. So I remember I had that, like in high school, everyone was like, Oh, Missouri, they're like, a, they're not good at football. And they got Kelly Bryant. It was like, aha. And then, you know, that loss to Vandy happened and it all went to, yeah. <laughs> to hell. But yeah, that's yeah. Arkansas. I mean, yeah. Arkansas lost to Vandy. I believe the last time they played them too. So, I mean, we, but I mean, we've also lost to North Texas and, you know, Western Kentucky was a big one because their quarterback was Arkansas's third string quarterback. Mm. Goes to Western Kentucky and puts up 350 plus on Chad Morrison, and that was the last hoorah. So, and and to make matters worse, the guy, um, Ty Story was his name. He was from Arkansas. He was an Arkansas kid, played, basically got shunned out, goes to Western Kentucky and then balls out and ends up being – him, no, it wasn't him. It was another quarterback from Arkansas on it being like the FCS Heisman winner or something like Starkle. Nick Starkle, guy from AM went to Arkansas. Oh, yeah. So, you know, there's a lot of lot of things that we can you're talking about coping. There's a yeah. lot of coping that Arkansas needs to do the past 15 years. <laughs> there's a lot of just like weird lore too. That's like my favorite part, especially now with kids staying in college for so long, is when you're like, oh my God, that guy's still in in school. Yeah. Um yeah, I, I do want to ask because you said you cover a lot of uh of Arkansas women's sports as well. Hmm. Um, I was at I was in uh, Greenville when they played uh, Missouri and women's basketball in that tournament. I was just curious your uh, expectations for uh, the women's basketball team for Arkansas this year. I know they're five and zero. They were they looked good in that game. I, I didn't get to watch much of them last year, but I know that is pretty much a South Carolina gauntlet. But you know they have any uh they have any tournament ambitions? They have to. Yeah, <laughs> I mean that, that's just where I mean. Look, they, they, you know, neighbors was on, and all, I was at that game. I was at the Arkansas Missouri game. Oh, nice. I, my family, like I said, it's ten minutes away, so I went and covered right. the SEC women's tournament, and stayed with my aunt and went to. I mean, because it was like a fifteen minute drive to Bon Secours. Mm -hmm. um, if you remember, five minutes left of the game, Missouri was up. Yeah, and Coach Neighbors was pacing back and forth, and all of a sudden. You know, Arkansas makes a comeback and wins the game. That's I believe me personally, and I'm close to Coach Neighbors. I mean, I'm I, I covered all the women's programs for five years, but he was pacing back and forth. You could kind of see was that going to be his last game? Mm -hmm. well, I mean, you could. I mean, you could see it. And I've told him that personally. You know, but this year they have a lot of talent. They got a um, uh, Sasha Goforth. She sat out because of an illness. She found out she had, she was getting really sick. Um, mm -hmm. She ended up coming back. Uh, they got a uh, sailor Poffenbarger. She was all, so they pretty much got two sec defenders and she was from UConn. And she actually, when UConn played Arkansas in Fayetteville, they beat UConn. Um, I mean, Paige Beckers was on a bum ankle and scored 27. I mean, that's just yeah. how good she I mean, is. Yeah. Uh, but this year, Arkansas has got Talia Scott, freshman. And I think in her first four games, she's already had 104 points and then had another double digit. I mean, she's she's one of them that she is going to be a spark for this team. But the, they're about 8-10 deep. But I love that. I want them to win. I want them to be that team because a lot of people jump on, on neighbors because he's an in-state guy. He's not won an NCAA tournament game since he's been here. But there's been two seasons where – they should have hosted in COVID, but 
They had to play it in the bubble. They were a four seed that year, should have hosted, got beat by Wright State. And then um, the year before, they got hosed by Tennessee because Tennessee never missed the NCAA tournament. So, of course, they're going to let in. And Arkansas beat Tennessee that year. So, he, he's got – he's he, the seat's, you know, warm there. But yeah. I mean, he I, he's got it going on, but he's got a good mix of players. They've implemented the press this year. So, um, I'm very um, – Y'all's point guard last year that uh, she you're talking about KJ. She's played there five, six years. And oh, Haley Frank. Yeah, she's she's finally yeah. out. So I mean, I mean, she was no, she's awful. still there. She's still there. Okay. Yeah, yeah. she's still there. <laughs> she's up on Arkansas. Thankfully, <laughs> thankfully, because Mrs. Wait, Coach Robin, hey, like her seat's warm too. But hey, Haley Troop was there for six years. She is that's who I'm thinking of. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, yeah, she's gone. Yes, she's gone. that's the one that all I mean, well, Frank did too. Yeah, those two girls always, I mean. And if it wasn't, I'm trying to think who kept them in the game in, in Greenville last year is one of them. But, I mean, we just couldn't put them away. But it's been like that every time Arkansas and Missouri play in women's basketball. It's always back and forth, and you just can't seem to – even though you might have the better team, you can't put them away. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, that's interesting because I know, like, Robin Pynchon at Mizzou, like, her seat's definitely very warm uh, with, like, you know, she gets a good recruiting class and then can never seem to do much with it. But I was just curious because I was at that game. And then – uh, tough. I mean, look, you, you – Yeah. Look, and this is – I'll talk about last year's Arkansas. We're talking about schedule. You know, Arkansas had to play LSU in Baton Rouge and then three days later go and play South Carolina in Columbia. Two games in three days against number one and number two on the road – and then traveling, and then they snowballed after that. I mean, that mm-hmm. it is a tough league, and it and it's a league that keeps getting tougher. I mean, you look what Don Staley's done, Kim Mulkey's done at LSU. Then you throw in what Yo's done at Missouri or um, Ole Miss. Harper's done at Tennessee. I mean, that it is a deep, deep league. Yeah, for sure. And then uh, just one last thing to quickly, because I know Mus uh, people are aren't people are uh, not as worried. It seems because Mizzou in men's basketball just lost to Jackson State, and like we are, we were kind of on here like this is the end. It's not. It's kind of doom and gloom. But I know you, you guys talked on your show. You were kind of like with Mus, and I know Arkansas is is at a different level this year than than Mizzou is. I think anyone will, will admit that. Um, but you know they they didn't seem as worried. But UNC Greensboro that was that had Mizzou fans smiling before Sunday at least. Oh yeah. Oh I mean, look. I mean, you don't want any time. I mean, especially Arkansas. to come in and, and beat you at home and but you know it was a case of they're looking ahead of the bahamas i mean you know mm-hmm. it's it but arkansas has always struggled i mean look you got to think this is a team that we're putting in an elite program you know we're talking about elite eight sweet 16s they were eight and ten in the sec last year i mean that that's where you that that's what must does in february march and april i mean that's just he okay. This is a team that could go eight and ten in the SEC, and everybody's still okay because all right. Well, we know he's going to pick it up in February, March. You know, last year having all those freshmen, and then Nick Smith Jr. was yeah, in and out tough. most of the season. Then Trevin Brazil got hurt. It was almost like you lost two of your starters. So that kind of I t- you know took a month to really ahead of schedule. I mean, they're usually peaking in January. It was almost February before they really started peaking as a team because you lose two of your top scores. I mean, it don't matter what team. You go to Duke, mm-hmm. Missouri, anybody, Kansas, Kentucky, you lose your two top scores, it's going to set you back for a month. Yeah. Trevin back, I mean, that guy can body. He, he's one of the best dunkers. I mean, one of at Arkansas. Yeah. Yeah. Not ever, he's all right. not ever, but he's, he's all right. Yeah, he's whatever. He's all right. he's, he's, he's whatever. <laughs> do we? Do Arkansas fans like Eric Musselman running around the locker room in uh track shorts? Is there as, long fans as, as long as we're winning, mm. he can do whatever he wants. Sense. Um, if if that was uh, uh Sam Pittman, um, no, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's just one of the things that you can get away with. The, and look, Eric Musselman outside of Arkansas is probably that. That's why he probably don't get you know, SEC coach of the year or nominated because it's a it's voted on by the SEC, voted on by the coaches, media. There's a lot of people who don't like it, but there's a lot of people who don't like Saban. There's a lot of people who don't like Bill Belichick. There, you know, you look at Geno, look at Pat Summit, you look at all the greats. Mm-hmm. A lot of them weren't liked. I mean, they were respected, but they weren't liked outside their own fan base. That That's Eric Musselman. And I'm glad he's here at Arkansas. I mean, that's all I got to say. 
Yeah, I can. I, I think I'm. I'm glad you said that because I feel like yeah, every other fan base is like. <laughs> yeah, I mean, taking your, it's it's one of them things you got to think and realize. Realistic part of this, it's all entertainment, guys. You know, yeah. Like if if you want to be a coach, and you look at it's and it's also a business. What you know, he can go to a Padres game now. I think he does it overkill where he can, he can go to a women's lacrosse game and you know he's got to take a picture with the coach or you know Snoop Dogg comes to town or anybody comes around he's taking a picture with him. But he's branding the university. It's all about a business and a brand. And all these kids, who's this guy? And now they're seeing Anthony Black, Nick Smith Jr., Jalen Williams, Isaiah Joe. You know all these guys going to the NBA. And then they see him running around and, and promoting this brand. Mm. Man, that's a guy I want to go work for. That's a guy I want to go play with because you see all that stuff on the outside, but he is hard-nosed. I mean, they won a game and he was giving everybody else. I mean, yeah. it was just because they weren't playing good enough defense. So it's that, it's that no-nonsense type of coach, but he'll have fun with you. That, that, that's almost the perfect balance. Kind of like Kirby, Kirby Smart's a little bit like that, you know? Yeah. You know, and I don't know what type of coach drink is when it comes to the football team, but you know, somebody that when it's business, it's business, but when it's time to go fun, be with the guys, resonate with your players because you don't resonate with your players in that generation, you're not going to get to recruit. Yeah, good point. That's, that's hard to argue. That was a good <laughs> spin zone. That was a good spin zone into Muss. He gets guys <laughs> to the league. Fair pro yeah, the brand. Fair enough. <laughs> Yeah. Um, well, all right. I, I mean, that's that's pretty much all we got. Um, Porter, thank you a ton for joining us. We'll definitely have to have you um, back on and, and you know, maybe, you know, in a year down the line, if it, we have when we have you back on for this game next year, it'll be, you know, seems like a very different look for Arkansas. Hopefully Missouri does absolutely nothing has the same exact <laughs> situation. We know that's not going to happen, uh, but it is what it is. But thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it. No problem, man. Appreciate it. Hey, we'll link up during basketball season. There we go. Yeah, we'll have mm -hmm. to. Thanks, Porter. <laughs> yes, sir. Okay, we now welcome on a very, very special guest. Uh, you Mizzou fans, at least, might know him as Third and Bannister, or better known as Barrett Bannister. We we sometimes, or at least Kenny might call him, um, maybe the unofficial um, media spokesperson for the Mizzou football team from last season. But it's Barrett Bannister. We're super excited to talk to him, especially given the game that's coming up here on Friday with Mizzou, Arkansas. Um, but first and foremost, Barrett, uh, welcome to the show. Um, thanks for coming on, and uh, you know, tell the people what you've been up to since you've been uh, catching or post year catching all those third down passes for your uh, in your Tigers career. Yeah, I mean, appreciate you guys having me on. Uh, it's good to talk to guys and uh, you know relive a little bit of my glory days a little bit. But um, yeah, so. Uh, Finish up season last year, uh, went through pro day and just didn't end up getting the opportunity. Uh, I wish I'd gotten, but that's okay. Uh, God had another plan for me. And so my wife and I are down, uh, back in Fayetteville where I grew up and I am an investment advisor. So, um, yeah. Awesome. And I know, uh, you know, you, we, everyone knows the walk on story, um, and how far you came, um, in your own career. Another guy in a similar situation, Cody Schrader, your former teammate on the offensive side of the ball. He's up for the Burlesworth Trophy this year. And I know that trophy meant a lot to you when you were a nominee last year with that Burlesworth being an Arkansas guy just like yourself. I mean, what can you kind of say about just, you know, another walk-on standing out at the University of Missouri and Cody Schrader this year? Yeah, 100%. I mean, you guys have seen it, and it's so cool that it's been able to be featured, you know, on national television like ESPN and CBS. Uh, Cody has had just a year that every single person would dream about, especially as a walk-on, um, leading the SEC in rushing yards, you know, having an historical game against Tennessee. And then, you know, for myself, when I got nominated for the Burlesworth, I was just excited because I got nominated. You know what I mean? Like, I, you know, I had a good year, but nothing like Cody's having and. Cody's really put himself in a position to where, you know, he is uh, a front runner for this thing. And, you know, I've looked at some of the names and seen some of the names around him, and I'm sure they're all very deserving. But obviously with my Mizzou bias a little bit, I think Cody's done um, enough. And, you know, I hope he has another statement game here on Friday. But uh, to really put himself in that conversation to be the nation's best walk on. And, man, that is that is so cool. And it could not go to a guy 
um, more deserving. I mean, Cody, every single thing that you guys read about him, about, you know, showing up last year after graduation and doing a full practice and pads, like none of that is show. None of it is like, hey, the coach has told him to do this. That, that, that's just Cody. And Cody's one of those guys that it makes me proud as an alumni to see him as a centerpiece and a foundation for a team that has done a lot of really, really good things. And I hope they do great things over these next two games. Um, to have him as just kind of a centerpiece for that program because, man, he is just – he's what he's what it's all about, man. He works hard and he does his thing. And obviously you mentioned an alum. Obviously your last season was just last year. Um, I mean, what has it been like to kind of just maybe watching from afar? I know you did just go to the game this past Saturday, but, I mean, to see the program just take the step it has this season, what has that been like for you, someone that was around the program for so many years? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's really, really cool. Um, obviously, it's fun living down here in hog country and getting to give every single person I see crap about it. Um, <laughs> but – it's really, really cool because, you know, you hear it over and over year after year, you know, those seniors, whenever they leave, it's like you were a foundation for this, you helped build this, and eventually it's going to, you know, you're going to reap the benefits that you've sown. And to finally see that come to fruition, I'm just so excited for the staff there, the people on that team, all the guys that I know in the locker room, all the fans that have supported us because, you know, it's, it's been a journey all the way from, you know, 2013, 2014, being in the SEC championship game to, you know, you had Odom come through and then you have drink and, you know, which each time there there's hope and, you know, there's downfalls and to finally see, you know, coach drink kind of break through that wall, win some of those close games and, you know, see those guys just, you know, living the dream. I mean, they're going to, they take care of this one. They're most likely going to get to play in a new year six bowl. And, you know, that's awesome for me to see. Obviously I wish I was able to play in it, but you know, <laughs> that's part of it. You, you grow up, you graduate. And uh, now I get to be, you know, a good supporting fan and um, support those guys in any way as I can. Yeah. Are you going to try and uh, make the trip if they do get new year's six, are you going to try to try and take off work? get off get up there or something 100 100 percent. i'm i'm selfishly hoping for the fiesta bowl so i can go play some golf while i'm out there get get rid of this cold weather for a little bit and go swing the sticks there you go um i i do want to ask him so like segwaying back to cody a bit and and with yourself too like can you kind of give a glimpse like i i know you said you know his stories you know all of that is is true and that's who he is but can you just kind of attest to the work that you have to do just to even sniff any playing time, let alone, I mean, what Cody's doing and even the stuff you did, um, you know, in your career, like, you know, just how hard is it that grind? Like, can you kind of attest to that a little bit? Yeah. I mean, you know, there's a lot of things that go into it. I mean, I think the first thing with a walk on is you're betting on yourself, right? You're going there with no expectations of, or I guess the coaches have no expectations of paying you any money. You're going there, you're working for free. And Cody and myself and many other people have done that. And it's just like, you have to put in an enormous amount of work to even get up to the same level playing field as those guys that are on scholarship, right, wrong, or indifferent. That's just the way it is. And the guys that make it are the ones that are willing to sacrifice, you know, the other parts of you know college that some guys aren't willing to sacrifice it's staying at the facility a little later it's making sure you're available to practice it's making sure that you know exactly what you're going to do not just in your scenario but if something happens to someone else you know you got to make yourself available um the story i always told people whenever you know as i kind of progressed through my walk-on story was it was in 2018 um it was my first season after red shirting and a guy named Rashad Floyd, he broke his you know, it was either tibia or fibia and, you know, spring camp. And then I was the number three slot on the depth chart. Right. And so we go into the South Carolina game and Jonathan Johnson gets hurt and Dominic Jacinto gets hurt. And Derek Dooley's kind of like, Oh crap, this is the only kid I have. Like I've got to put him in, but I put myself in position 
to be successful because I knew what I was doing. I prepared the way I knew I was supposed to prepare, and I went out and I made a play, right? And A.J. Ofadale, my receivers coach at the time, told me he was like, you don't know how big that was for you. One game rep is worth a thousand practice reps. And so now I had built that trust where I was able to be in a game and push comes to shove. We have Albert O get hurt and they started putting in some 10 personnel stuff. And I just happened to be the guy that knew what the tight end was doing on every play. It didn't happen by chance. I did that on purpose because I needed to know every single position to put myself to be successful. And I'm not saying this to toot my own horn, but that's the kind of stuff that it takes whenever you're a walk on and you're trying to, you know, get a niche on someone or get that edge on someone who you wouldn't have um, otherwise. And so, you know, I end up going, making a couple of plays in 2018 and then it's like, okay, this kid can play and you get more opportunities. And so it's the same thing with Cody, you know, he came in last spring and worked his tail off, showed that he was going to run harder than every single other person. He was going to do the dirty work in the past game that nobody else wanted to do. And so you get a guy like that, the opportunity to get on the field, And now you're seeing it this fall and you saw it last fall too. The kid runs harder than any back in the SEC, right? Yeah. There's a reason, I guess it was until the Tennessee game that he hadn't lost a yard running the ball the whole year. It's because he gets downhill, he puts his nose down. And if he's going to take a hit from a 350 pound nose tackle, he's going to take it, but he's going to be moving forward doing it. Yeah. And, you know, Mm -hmm. I think that's just kind of, I don't know if that answers your question or not, but that's that's what it takes. And I think that's why you've seen guys like Cody and other guys who have been successful as walk ons like there's a different way they carry themselves. And, you know, yeah. Cody is the epitome of that. Sorry if I drew that on for a really long time. No, no, that's that's, that's awesome. A, I, I can't believe you had to literally play like everyone was injured in that South Carolina game. They're going to have you playing quarterback yeah. next. You know, that kept going. <laughs> yeah, that's that's awesome. Yeah, I don't know. And well, one thing that just came into my mind is that, you know, a lot of people when uh, Cody showed up and he did talking to coaches, a lot of people didn't even know who he was when, when he when he joined the team. And, and we know the stories about, you know, how Drinkwitz found out about him and how he got there. When he got there, you know, did you go up to him and tell him, you know, like you you can have an opportunity here? You, you know, the grinds, you know, did you like ever kind of think, you know, this guy could be a top rusher in the SEC? Because, I mean, a lot of people probably didn't even think about it. Yeah. Um. Honestly, I don't know if I ever had that specific conversation with him, but it kind of goes back to what I was talking When you're a walk-on and you come there, you almost have to have a sense of arrogance about you where it's like, I know I can play with these people and I don't have to have you or anybody else tell me that, right? And so obviously it's nice whenever someone does, but I think Cody's always had that had that about himself it's an arrogance and a belief in him i guess belief is probably the better word he has that belief and that confidence in himself but as you can still tell like even from the story about him not wanting to go back in to get hurt to break that record or whatever right there there's cody is very much a humble guy great sense of humility but he has that belief in that um i don't want to call it arrogance but that proudness that he you know he knows he can compete at this level and he's shown it and so um and then obviously watching him last year you know it was easy for me to see that hey this kid can play and he can help us and i want to honestly go back to something you touched on a bit earlier obviously you're from fayetteville went to high school there um you were joking about how you were giving a lot of arkansas fans crap down there with the, the season both teams are having Um, you came to Mizzou in 2017. Like you said, you were a walk on, um, you even went through a coaching change and you still stuck with Mizzou the entire, your entire college career of like five or six years. Um, I mean, what kind of just drew you to stick with Mizzou? I mean, what kind of just, cause a lot of people, I think in your position probably would have been like, well, maybe I'll go somewhere. I can go get more playing time. So what kind of just drew you to staying at Mizzou? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think there was a great sense of gratitude for what that university had done for me. Um, I always said it was my dream growing up to play in the SEC. And that university, um, albeit it wasn't Coach Trink's staff, um, it was, you know, Andy Hill, Barry Odom, those guys that gave me that opportunity. Um, That university gave me an opportunity to live out my dreams. 
And, uh, you know, yes, there obviously could have been opportunities where I could have gone other places, got more playing time, got more touches, you know, things of that nature. But in my mind and in my head, it was always, you know, this is the university that gave me um, the chance to live out my dreams. This is a university that gives me a chance to compete in the SEC. And then, you know, everything else after that is, you know, I've built a lot of great relationships here with people outside of football too, right? I met my wife there. There's people in the administration that I'm, you know, still really good friends with. I texted with Mike Kelly today. You know, it's relationships like that that I think are going to get lost as you go through this cycle of the transfer portal now and everything that um, just that continuity that guys are able to build whenever they're at a place for six years. Well, my case, six years, five years is the max, I guess, after this whole COVID thing um, passes through. But, you know, I think that's the part that is really special and sometimes gets lost in it. Um, You know, 1% of college athletes are going to get to go play in the NFL. Right. And the majority of us are going to end up, you know, doing whatever else we do in our respective careers. And the more you move around the same with any job, the less relationships that you build and the less, um, you know, resources you're going to have at play as you go down uh, in life with that. And so that was kind of um, everything that factored in with that for me. And, you know, I also, I loved Mizzou and I still love Mizzou. Like there was no reason to ever, um, you know, go to another place because that, that was home for me and still is. Yeah. I, I think that's really refreshing in this day and age of like, you know, when people, yeah, are, are able to make the jump and you have looser transfer portal rules and everyone's different, but I think that's a, it's obviously a great tale. And, and I know the fans were happy that you, you stuck around for so long and you mentioned like the continuity thing too, that triggered like a bit, bit of a two-parter question. You, you know, you were there for the regime change when they went from Odom to drink. So I want to ask just kind of, what that was like with Drinkwitz and how he, you know, kind of quickly tried to embed his own culture and his philosophy, like within the team um, and, and just how that transition, you know, going from a, a coach to a new kind of um, culture was. And then, um, you know, second part too. I know Jacob Peeler came in, you know, January before your last season, you know, he, he's gotten a lot of praise from us and for his development of receivers. What was it like working with him for a year and, and what you got to see him do with, with some of those other receivers you were uh, teammates with? Yeah, Sorry, that's a big I one. mean, <laughs> no, no, I love that. I love that. Uh, so from the coaching change thing, you know, as a player, when you're involved in it, like everyone has their own opinions, right? When it happens, like, obviously there was a great deal of shock whenever coach Odom got fired. We, we were all kind of under the impression that if we won that Arkansas game in 2019, he was going to get another opportunity and, you know, right, wrong or indifferent, that coaching change happened. And, you know, there's players feelings who gets hurt and, you know, things of that nature. But I think the old thing that is said in recruiting is, you know, you don't want to go to a place because of a coach. You want to go to a place because of the school. And, um, you know, that probably gets lost sometimes now with the transfer portal and it's probably changed a little bit, but, when Drinkwitz came on, um, you know, the biggest things that he was trying to build was, you know, that culture and he's not going to come down from his standard that he had built at Appalachian State. Not that they hadn't already had a great culture, but he knew what it took to be successful and to try and build a championship program. And, you know, there was a lot of hiccups along the way. I mean, I think for the last three, I mean, for when I was there with drink, we were five and five, six and seven, six and seven. And, you know, there was a lot of bruises and, you know, like I said, roadblocks where it's like, you know, are we ever going to get there? But winning doesn't happen overnight. And you got guys who he's finally, I mean, gosh, your starting quarterback is his first recruiting class in 2020. Uh, the guy in Brady Cook, who, you know, I roomed with him and one of my best friends and he's a guy that has grown in these three years. He gets his first start in the bowl game in 2021. And it's like, you know, he's growing, he's buying into the culture. He's starting to lead the program. He's starting to play better. And then you got got other pieces like Darius Robinson, you know, Javon Foster, those guys that have been there forever. Right. And you're just building this culture, you're instilling it. And so then when you bring in these transfer pieces, like, you know, Cody Schrader or a hopper, 
or people like that, where they're able to start contributing, you know, that cult culture and foundation is already built. And so you do that and then you mix special talent with guys like Luther, it, it creates a really good recipe for success. And, you know, I think drinks just really done a good job of, you know, he's not going to change. This isn't going to be something that just like, Oh, we have the silver bullet. Now it's no, we're going to keep hitting that rock, keep hitting that rock, keep hitting that rock. Right. And eventually it's going to break. You don't know when it's going to be maybe swing 25. It may be swing five. You don't know, but I think he's done a phenomenal job of that. Um, and, you know, honestly, I think him being able to, you know, free up some of his time by bringing on a guy like Kirby Moore, where Kirby's able to kind of, you know, take reins on the offense a little bit and drinks able to free up a little bit more time for himself to, you know, continue to grow that culture, continue to be recruiting in the highest possible level, but still also be able to give his input and his insight and his expertise on the offense is huge for the program. Just it, it gives, you know, him more opportunity to you know make sure everything is taken care of for that team and that roster and so i think that's kind of how he's done it and for the coach peeler question um i've had a lot of really good receiver coaches i think i had five whenever i was there um but coach peeler was the most detailed the most um probably yelled the most too but uh <laughs> he uh was the most detailed, most passionate receivers coach that I have ever been with. And similar to Coach Drink, he is kind of an unapologetic, um, will hold you to a standard, and it just is what it is. Like, there's no backing down from it. And, you know, he always will show us clips of, you know, the A.J. Browns, the D.K. Metcalfs, the Elijah Moores, about to be Luther Burdens, you know, that he's coached. And it's like you see these guys playing on Sundays and where they got it from, right? Like, yeah. literally, I can sit there and turn on A.J. Brown's tape or D.K. Metcalf's tape, and I can be like, holy crap, like, that's exactly what Coach Peeler teaches. Like, that is cool to watch yeah. for me. Now, obviously, I couldn't do the stuff, some of the stuff that D.K. and A.J. <laughs> were doing. I would do it to the best of my ability. That's why I'm right. working as an investment advisor and not playing on freaking Monday night football. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, Peeler is, is authentic and is hardworking and as passionate and as detailed as anyone I've been around um, from that standpoint. And man, he is very, very good at his job and, you know, such a relational person too. It's not just about what you do on the field so much about what you get on the field as a product of the relationships you've built off the field, right? You want people yeah. that want to go play hard for their coach. You want people that are going to go play hard um, because they trust you, because of the relationships you've built. And then, you know, it's twofold is, you know, Peeler's got to trust you as a player, right? He's got to know that you're putting in the work and understand that, you know, the details of um, what's going on on the field and trust that you're going to be able to get that job done. Yeah, that's, that's funny to me that he does the, Hey, look at this DK Metcalf tape. Be just do that. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I remember. Seriously, we, I mean, go ahead. There was that one time at practice too that he would like throw like footballs to y'all just so wobbly, and he's like, "SEC receivers make SEC catches," and it's balls that you guys couldn't even catch, but he was just throwing them as random spots. Hundred percent, and I mean, I think that just should. I mean. He, his standards up here and it's like he's not coming down from it right and that's like yeah. it just is what it is it's you, we're not gonna adapt to the weakest link we're gonna be as strong as the strongest and um that's just kind of how he operates and you know it, it it was a really good thing for this university when he was hired and um he's done a great job definitely staying staying on the wide receivers um i gotta ask you about makai miller uh, you talked so highly about him last season when he was a freshman. And now, you know, he's he's been, seen some injuries, but, you know, he's finding himself open on third downs just like you were. And you talked about taking advantage of when you're on the field. Um, he's been doing that a lot the last two years. I mean, what made Makai so special and, you know, so easy, like, for him to just want to learn? Yeah, I mean, a lot of that is uh, kind of that humility thing I was talking about, right? Like, Makai was very – impressive high school prospect came in and you know he could have been just like I know everything but he just you know put himself at the bottom of the totem pole and was like I'm gonna learn whatever I can and you know it happened 
all last year he's learning, he's learning, he's learning. And, you know, I got hurt on that New Mexico State game and he comes in the Arkansas game and on that critical third down, he runs an option route, right? Breaks in, perfect. He had been talking to me all week about it. Like, what looks am I going to be seeing? How should I do this? How should I execute it? Goes in, freaking does it perfect. Makes the play and it's like, dude, like you've sown all those seeds all year, worked your butt off. Like, yeah, he had made catches before that, made a couple plays in the Florida game that were really big. But it's just like, that was like the moment where I was like, man, this kid gets it. Like he gets it. He comes in, he works hard. He puts his head down. And, you know, as he grows in his career, he's going to be successful in whatever he does. And the more opportunities that come his way, you know, he's going to continue to take advantage of them. And, you know, it was similar. I was sitting up there in the indoor club or whatever last weekend against Florida. And I think it was those two catches on that two minute drivers Florida. It was 10 yard option routes, you know, it was break in, break out. And it was Makai doing it perfectly. And I just know, there's a reason that they're going to him in those situations just because they trust him, right? He's going to make good decisions and he's going to go make those plays. That's awesome. I want to, I want to, um, you touched on him earlier and uh, I want to ask you more about Brady cook because obviously, I mean, you've seen basically from when he got to Mizzou to where he is now. And I'm sure you Brady, everybody, I mean, Brady has even talked about it. Uh, he, he's, taken his fair amount of criticism uh over the last year or so but now he's really i think grown into just one of the better sec quarterbacks i mean what is what has it been like to watch him just grow into such a like just he's gotten better and better almost every game it feels like this is another kid that's you know i am so 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 proud of Brady because in this world of instant gratification and you know you can read just about every th negative thing and you want about him on social media um that's been tweeted at him I mean that kid stuck with it and there was every reason in the world that he could have said like now nah, I'm good I'll just go somewhere else but he stuck with it and that dude played on a torn labrum in his throwing shoulder last year right like that is not like that's not normal right people people would get surgery call it a year like it is what it is but brady like continued to just put his body on the line for us and you know him finally getting to be healthy this off season and coming back healthy you know and kind of just taking lead and taking control of this offense and this kind of retooled regrouped offense that, you know, Kirby Moore has created. It's been awesome to see. And I'm just so proud of him because he's kind of came into himself as a quarterback, right? He he's making the throws that need to be made, um, you know, on pressure situations, uh, hitting some more of his deep ball throws. And those guys are going downfield and making those catches. And then, you know, obviously he's using his God given ability to run the football, right? His legs are a big part of that offense and um, you're seeing it. And so, you know, I couldn't be more proud of a kid just because I say kid, like of a man, you know, he's one of my best friends. Like he's been, he went through a lot last year and there was a lot of criticism that was said about him every single Saturday, fans booing at him in the stands. And it's just like, dude stuck with it. And now he is, quarterback of a nine win football team has a chance to go win 11 and you know probably going to be one of the better mizzou seasons remembered in the last i mean gosh ever i mean 11 wins yeah. heck of a year if they're able to get it done and what he's accomplished so far is super impressive and so uh you know he knows how i feel about him but that i mean mizzou fans should really appreciate what they got in front of them definitely Good and i think stuff. you know yeah yeah, definitely a true son. And I think it's been it's been great to see, you know, the support turn, you know, for the better for him. Uh, so on, on the same subject, a uh, little bit more lighthearted, but you mentioned you roomed with him. I know quarterbacks, especially, you know, they got to be all methodical and some can have some kind of like funny tendencies. Do you have any funny uh, Brady Cook roommate stories or memories or just things that he did? Um, Let's see. Well, he's a clean freak, which is kind of funny okay. to me because I am not the uh, cleanest person I would say, but I mean, you will be 
sitting there and you know you'll like finish your eating off your plate right and you're like eating on the couch or something you'll like put your plate down just because you're like watching tv or whatever brady will like get up from what he's doing and just go clean the plate and then like put it away and then come back and like finish watching tv or the movie or whatever and (laughs) it's just kind of like okay like i was gonna clean it but thank you um and so (laughs) i mean that's one kind of not that being clean's a bad thing, but he, he he's a little he's a little uh, little um I don't know a little nitpicky about it. I guess would be the yeah. proper way to say it. Yeah, a little nitpicky no. about it. Um, trying to think if there's another one of him. He uh, I don't know if it's a weird thing, but him him and I really got into hot yoga together, and that was kind of our oh, thing okay. that we did together. And I know him and Cody have done that a lot, and so uh, Brady's a big um kind of health nut, hot yoga, meditation, that type deal. Um, and, you know, we had a lot of fun doing it together. And so, um, yeah. That's that's what I feel like I've learned about him and Cody is like, I remember hearing Cody on Pat McAfee and and they he was like, did you get to did you get to go out, Cody, after and celebrate? You know, after you got all these yards against Tennessee? He's like, no, no, I went home and watched Phil. It seems like Brady and him are both like, you know, they're they're wired in, and I mean, you know, the results have paid off. But that's that is pretty funny that he's a he's a clean freak. Hundred percent, hundred percent. That's them. Yeah. <laughs> um, you mentioned a little bit earlier that if you know you got the Fiesta Bowl, you could get your golf game going. Um, I remember listening to a podcast once. You talked a lot about your golf game. Yeah, you're really into it. Um, if that was like a sport that you could have pursued, like instead of football in college, would you have done it? I think I would have pursued it with football. Uh, like I said, my dream was always to play SEC football. Um, I was fortunate to grow up with a dad who played a lot of golf and had the opportunity to do that. If I was able to, you know, relive it all again, do it all again, I would probably choose golf. My body would, um, my body would feel a little bit better. Um, but no, I mean, football was everything. It still is. It's so much, it was such a fun time of my life to be able to play it, but, you know, I think golf's really special too. And, um, you know, there's a place for it and, um, there's a place for both for sure. That was something me, me, Brady and Cody, uh, and some other guys went down to the lake this summer and all had a golf trip down at Portachima and everything. And so that was a blast. And another thing that we really bonded over and, you know, it's fun whenever he'll send me, you know, videos of his swing over during the summer and, you know, I'm sending him videos of mine <laughs> and everything. So who won that uh, trip? Uh, well, we did a, a partner format and okay. I believe Brady was actually my partner, um, in that, and I think we got second and we lost to uh, Will Norris and who was Will's partner? <laughs> it might've been Cody. It might've been Will and Cody. Okay. Huh. Yeah. It's Will, Will can hit the crap out of the, Will can hit the crap out of the golf ball. He hits it a long ways. And a I don't know if I. <laughs> I don't know if I would have picked Will. I said and, and a punter because of the oh, yeah. unfortunate Kentucky oh. game. So. <laughs> Brutal. Yeah, that um, was unfortunate. I mean, we. I always tell Will on a side note. I'm like, you know, you you genuinely have done about more than anyone at this university. You literally got a rule of college football change. You did because yeah. of what you did. Like, like, like yeah. you, you had an influence on the game of football that very there few people can say, like you got a rule change. They need to the send him like rule. a copy of it to frame. Yeah. Call it the Norris rule. Um, that, that'd okay. be sick. Honestly, maybe, maybe I'll go uh, propose that. There you <laughs> go. <laughs> uh, just two quick ones. Um, obviously got to ask all those years there. What, what is your favorite memory from your land days at mizzou and um second question uh how did you do it on third down man it was like it was like magic how (laughs) what was your secret how did you do it oh gosh um favorite memories uh i'll give you three as any true politician would um (laughs) i think self selfishly one of my favorites is, you know, when coach Odom brought me in and told me I was on scholarship, um, 
that was a really special moment for me, special moment for my parents, grandparents, aunt, uncle, brother, sister. Um, that was really, really cool uh, just to kind of see, uh, you know, reaping the benefits of my hard work and the people that poured a lot of resources and effort into me. Um, that was a really special memory for me. Um, and then I think the other two kind of go hand in hand. Um, road wins are always really special. But we went, I think it was in 2018, Florida was number 12 in the country. We went down there and beat them on the road. And then South Carolina last year, um, I think they were number 20, uh, 20 or something. Yeah, something like that. But anytime you're able to get a road win, a top 25 road win, um, really, really cool. Really cool to celebrate in another team's locker room and um, makes the flight home a lot more enjoyable. So those are probably two from football, one from kind of, you know, off the field, but that would be probably my favorite, um, favorite ones. Nice. And then you asked me another question. Gosh, let me. It was, how, how did you do, oh, how'd you do it? How do you do third it? Down. Yeah. How'd you do it? Ow. Third down. Oh gosh. Ow. That, that was a question. How? Um, yeah, I got lucky. No. Um, <laughs> you know, like I said, my niche was kind of, you know, make the tough catches. I'm going to be quicker than you within a little square box and just understanding, you know, where coverage was and what they were trying to do. And so, you know, as offenses changed and, you know, I was getting to run some option routes early in my career to, you know, later, not as much option routes and more just feeling space. Um, you know, it was just getting on the same page with the quarterbacks and, you know, a lot of third downs is, you know, them going where they have trust and they have faith in the receiver to be where they are and make the play. And so, um, you know, my biggest goal every time during the off season was whoever, you know, was going to be the quarterback. It was, you know, I got to go build a trust and a connection with them that they know, you know, they can trust me whenever the, you know, it's crunch time. And so, you know, always tried to be the right place. Um, you know, the best ability is availability that helps at practice. You know, you're making third down catches in practice. Um, you know, it's going to convert to a game. And so uh, I was really fortunate. A lot of people put me in a lot of really good places to be successful. And then, you know, I was able to finish the job. Definitely. Definitely. Well, Bear, we won't. I, we know you're in your car because you said you didn't want to do the uh, interview in front of your Arkansas fan boss, which is a very fair. Um, so we won't. We, yeah. we won't make. Sorry you if sit it's in dark there, in here, uh, but no, that's okay. We don't. We just didn't want to make you sit in your car for too much longer. But uh, are you going to be at the game on uh, on Friday? You can try and go. Yeah, hundred um, percent. Yeah, I'll be on the sidelines, be rooting for those guys, and you know, fired up. And you know, this one means a little bit more to me than all the other ones. So uh, you know, Definitely. hopefully, we make it six out of seven, and you know put those guys in their place. <laughs> definitely. Um, well, yeah, Barrett, thank you so much. We definitely would, uh, we'd love to have you back on uh, another time just to, to talk ball, whatever, talk golf. If you want, maybe if you get out to All Arizona, right. if that's how it goes, you know? <laughs> yeah. Hey, you guys have me on anytime. I love talking ball. love talking Missouri and whatever you guys want to talk about, we can make it fun and um, we'll have at it. Excellent. Maybe we'll get Drew on with you next time. Ask him about his celebrations. <laughs> That'd be a good idea. <laughs> good look into it. All right. Well, thanks, Bear. We appreciate it. Yeah, appreciate y'all. Okay, quick hits time. Kenny, you start us out. You've got a Mizzou jersey of the week. What you got? Yeah, Mizzou jersey of the week. Former Tigers big man, Jonte Porter, tearing it up in the G League. We talked a little bit about him this summer with some of the training camp and summer league action, but Jonte dropped 21 points with 20 rebounds, six blocks, and six assists on November 20th, which was Monday for the Crews, which is the G League affiliate of the Pistons. Um, pretty good start for Motor City as well. They are 4-0. Oh, go Crews. Yeah, shout out. I'm glad he's still floating around in the near around the league, kind of. I didn't know he was he he made his way there. My Peyton. jersey of the week, uh Lance Lynn. Uh he's back homecoming. Coming home again. Uh Money Mo has struck the Cardinals rotation. Consider it completely fixed. Lance Lynn, one of two starting pitcher um acquisitions by the lowly Cardinals. Um Go Cubs. This is welcome news for them. Uh, Lance Lynn is not very good, um, but the Cardinals sure think they can fix them. Cardinals suck. 
a warning there's to the, the West. <laughs> uh, there's also a, uh, people might not remember, Lance Lynn almost won the AL Cy Young in 2020. If he didn't make his final start against the Astros, he would have won the award, but the Astros blew him up. Um, very unfortunate for the big man. Damn. Well, welcome back. Uh, my jersey of the week, I'm giving it to Nick Bolton, um, who is proving that the Chiefs need him in the lineup to win. The Chiefs lost to the Eagles in a big Monday night football game in Kansas City. Joe Buck specifically name dropped Nick Bolton and said uh, Kansas City is really missing their star linebacker who they got out of Missouri a couple of seasons ago. Um, he said Mizzou. Bolton, he didn't even say Missouri. Or yeah, he said Mizzou. Star linebacker they got out of Mizzou. So, yeah, Nick Bolton's been a stud. Of course, had that wrist injury a while ago. Hopefully, he can come back for the Chiefs' playoff push because clearly they need him. They can't beat the best if they don't have the best. Never forget that man was Super Bowl MVP for a half of football. We miss I want to shout out our, our buddy Jay Graham over, I believe, in Tennessee right now. It just reminded me um, because we made a bet with him that if Mizzou oh, beat yeah. Tennessee, he'd had to post a Nick Bolton clip. He posted it. He was not very happy posting it. You could tell by his caption, but uh, he was a good sport about it. We were going to do uh, our end of the bet. We would have worn our overalls. Um, but shout out to Jay because can I get a big old M-I-Z? And then it's always a good one. One of right. my favorite clips ever. Fantastic yeah, Four. It's an awesome one because you can see uh, everyone else is just buzzed or drunk. Mahomes, Mahomes just, like hammered yeah. out of his mind, smiling behind him. <laughs> Cracks me up. Anyway, All right. Unwritten Fantastic, Fantastic Four. Four picks their records right now Peyton is in first place at 25 16 and 3 I'm in second place at 21 20 and 3 and Jack you are at 20 21 and 3 and to start it off this week we're going to do the Black Friday game at 2 p.m Dolphins are favored by 10 points on the road against the Jets the Jets have Tim Boyle at quarterback explain yourself how how do you have the Jets covering we have a clean sweep everyone's taking the Jets it looks like (laughs) yeah okay you want to know you yeah. rally around a, a new quarterback. They're going to rally around the Boilmeister. Um, I think Boiler the Dolphins maker. have been playing close football. They had a close game on the road against the Raiders. I mean, it's just how they've been playing uh, recently. I think the Jets aren't going to win this game, but 10 points is a lot. And I think Tim Boyle could bring the Jets back to mediocrity. And the defense of the Jets isn't terrible. Um, maybe they can oh, get a, a score on, on defense. I just yawned because your get- take is putting me to sleep. They could Stop score this. twice on defense, and I just don't think their offense will be able to get within 10 of Miami's. I mean, it's no. it's literally coughing baby versus hydrogen bomb. I think you guys are overthinking this one. I, I think I, it's going to be a Black Friday special. We're overthinking this Yeah, all right. I hope the Jets were in the black uniforms. Okay, second game on the docket. The Jags are favored by one point on the road. My hometown, Houston, against the Texans. Jack and myself are taking the Texans. Peyton is taking the Jaguars. He doesn't believe it. you can beat a team twice. He doesn't believe the Texans could beat the Jags twice. Uh, Peyton, explain yourself. Yeah, the Texans are good. I think this will be a very good game. If it's a minus one spread. It basically comes down to who do I think is going to win. I think the Jags will win. And um, I, I don't know. It, it's just... I could go either way on this game. I just don't see the Texans beating the Jags twice this year. The Jags are a very good team. Um, Texans are not bad by any stretch. I think this will be a good game, but I do think the Jags will get it done. I only picked the Texans because of their all-red uniforms. I really think this is a toss-up. So I just decided to go because it, it, it literally is a pick em. So uh, I'll take the Texans. Why not? It's a fun story. It's TJ Stroud. Yep. It'll be cool to see how CJ bounces back as well after his worst three picks. career start yeah. against or against the Cardinals. So third game, Steelers favored by one and a half points on the road against the Bengals. Jack and myself are taking the Steelers. Peyton is taking the Bengals. One Stullers. thing I have to tell you, and we always talk about this. You rally around a team that just fired a coach. Yeah, yeah Peyton you Steelers are, I'm fired Oh, Canada. Canada. Nope, can't I'm switch. Switching. I already, I already yeah, made the call. What do you mean you can't switch? We switched can't literally switch. last week. You're no, headed by too much to switch. You're not allowed to switch. switch. You know not what? allowed to switch. Fine. You are allowed to switch, but I'll I'll keep I'll keep it with the Bengals here. I've never switched. Um, you know Jenny, why? Have you ever switched? I've never switched. What are you switched in the last two weeks? I've I never remember switched. it. Not one time. Nope. Whatever. Jake Browning, Hive, we will not be accepting new applications to the bandwagon after his breakout this week. This guy was a baller at Washington. His Huskies are in playoff position. This team will be nothing without Shiesty Joe. Nothing. In the playoff picture, 
Jake Browning was made for these moments. Nothing without Joe. And they fired Matt Canada. Stillers. I would switch if I could, which I can, but I'm not going <laughs> to. Um, no, you can't. For that reason, you can switch. This is so No, you tough. can't. We've never switched. You're All trying right. to gaslight us, Peyton. Last game on the docket, Ravens are favored by three and a half on the road in L.A. against the Chargers. Jack and myself are taking the Ravens. Peyton, you're taking the Chargers. Take it away. I hope Quentin Johnston's mom did not put in her two weeks um, because, boy, does he stink. Um, but the Chargers lose every game by three points, not 3.5. So I'm going to take the Chargers to cover. I, I hope I want Zay Flowers to score an, uh, a touchdown in this game because the Chargers picked Quentin Johnson ahead of Zay Flowers in this draft, uh, in this last draft. So give me the Ravens. Ah, ah. Last thing I'll mention about this game is if it was in, if this game was in Baltimore, I would maybe count on one hand how many Chargers fans make that trip. There's just no way that there would be more than 10 Chargers fans making a trip to Baltimore. I think I think some Ravens fans are, are pretty dedicated that they'll make the trip to L.A. That's the last thing I'll say. Let's Agreed. move on. Uh, what's the next segment? Well, I like no cap, and he's the main bird. Shawnee's main bird of the week, Penny. The Shawnee's main bird of the week for myself goes to Kyle Gibson, former Mizzou Tiger, back in his home state. He signed with the St. Louis Cardinals yesterday. Another starting pitcher joining that rotation. As Peyton brought up a little bit earlier, the big man, Lance Lynn, also in that rotation. Um, good to have Kyle Gibson back in the, his home state. And he just uh, had a house built in St. Louis. So um, if some guys like to have you know, their house in the city that they live in during the summer. He's going to be living in the same house year round. So that, that's pretty cool for Kyle Gibson. Yeah, no, that's definitely the better of the two to uh, that were acquired. But the Cardinals came in. Cardinals fans were dreaming about uh, Yamamoto and – Aaron Nola coming into this offseason, which, by the way, is also hilarious that they ever thought they could get them. Um, and they've wound up with this. So, Cardinals suck. Uh, my, dirt suck. Main, my main bird of the week, the Marquette Golden Eagles. Folks, the Marquette Golden Eagles in the Maui Invitational, uh, they're the number four team. They played number one in the nation, Kansas, and they absolutely dominated them. Hunter Dickinson, you lost to the Marquette Golden Eagles. Um, yeah, this was like legit. Because I mean, I'd love to know what happened really in that secret scr scrimmage between Mizzou and Marquette uh, because Marquette very clearly, I mean, they're going to play Purdue today um, in a battle for the number one, all, all likely a number one spot in the AP rankings next week. Um, so, yeah, Marquette, goal, they're my uh, main bird of the week. Yeah, this is a this is a not a fun game to root for for me. I don't like either of these schools, uh, Kansas, for obvious reasons. But I'm not a Marquette guy. But they are very good. So credit to them for knocking off number one. Kansas might be a little fraudy. They were down by 16 to Kentucky at one point. I don't know. Not, I mean, I love can't win. Love love Shaka Smart too. Uh, saw his last game in Texas. Kenny and I saw his last game. Yeah. Walk walk a Shaka. He's awesome. Um, my main bird of the week goes to Turkey. It's Thanksgiving. People eat turkey at Thanksgiving. And this is where I want to segue. You know, Thanksgiving, it's obviously an interesting time. You know, if you get together with a, a big group of your family members, sometimes, you know, you get some into in, some intense debates. You know, some people might have some takes, you know, arguments, big family all together. I have a new debate topic that's been sweeping the Twitter sphere that I think you should uh, enact at your family dinner table here this Thanksgiving season. Ditch the politics and instead talk about what everyone on twitter has been talking about which is is lightning mcqueen the goat everyone's been posting you know lightning mcqueen washed doc hudson washed did chick hicks did he have a mickey mouse title i think that would be a much more uh, fun discussion to have around your thanksgiving dinner while you're eating some turkey and guys is lightning mcqueen the goat this is a debate so intense uh Stephen a has even weighed in <laughs> he did, on he it. fielded a question um, First of all, I'd like to address the turkey thing. I'm more of a ham guy, but turkey is the classic. Can't fault anyone for liking turkey. Um, it's the my, bird, my, so that's why I had My it. stance on the goat, I'm throwing Doc Hudson out. I'm throwing McQueen out. I'm throwing Storm Jackson out. That fraud. Um, give me strip every single day of the week. The Dynaco no, Blue. I played in such an old era of cars. Dynaco Blue. You know what? He was in prime position to go out 
in a very respectable manner before Dick Hicks did that dirty bit maneuver. That's um, true. He's a classic. He's an icon. That that Fender. I mean, how can Fender, you debate that? One. Mm-hmm. Give me give me strip every day of the week. Well, I'm so glad Lightning didn't pull like a LeBron move and go to Dinoco and at the end, you know, like how LeBron went to LA. Yeah, just, that would have been like know, a super team. for the uniform. Um, that was a little bit ridiculous. Uh, I mean, I don't really care who the goat is. I think it's Lightning McQueen. I mean, you got to go. You with just the OG. appreciate watching all of them in their prime. I mean, I'm gonna yeah. It's, it's, I mean, he's pretty much LeBron. Like you might not think he's the goat, but he's literally the face of the league. And the, I mean, he made the most money of anyone ever. So I think you got to go with the guy who made the most money and entertained us the most. The movies are about yeah, him. He put Rusty's on the map, you know, humble beginnings. You know, he, he was got a little bit too big for his britches, got humbled down in Radiator Springs, made an epic comeback. Yeah, you know, that, that's my goat for me. Give me give me the McQueenster. Um, see, you can have a very sound debate at your Thanksgiving dinner table. Uh, all right, best thing you learned, Peyton. Uh, clean sweep, baby. <laughs> the Cardinals are in every single Cardinals, segment. Yeah. Former uh, former uh, Cardinals shortstop Paul DeJong, Paul De April, Paul De Korea. Um, he is moving on to greener pastures. By that I mean he's donning some pinstripes. No, not the Yankees. He's going to the Chicago White Sox, folks. That's right. South side bound. Paul DeJong will be their start, their starting shortstop. Can you imagine the six four three of DeJong to Nicky Lopez to Vaughn? That is the least electric double play that will ever be turned. <laughs> I don't even know who they'd be tanking for at this point. <laughs> Just some <laughs> high school or some college guy we haven't even thought of or seen yet. Um, the Cardinals hate isn't over. Or maybe this is some Cardinals love, depending on how you felt about Mike Schilt. But former Cardinals manager Mike Schilt, who was um, at the head of St. Louis for 2018 to 2021, is now a manager again. Different circumstances, though. The Padres... Kind of down in some money. I still have some good pieces, but he is now the manager out there in San Diego. Was a coach, was working with the organization in the last two years. Uh, but good to see Mike Schilt back in back as a skipper. There you go. You Cardinals do suck. Yeah, I, I mean, I think a lot of people would agree that there's a lot of better options than what Ollie Marmol has done right now. Way to way oh. to get cards in in November. Well done. Um my best thing I learned this week, I have two. Uh, one, I'm just giving credit to a, a Mizzou fan on Twitter. Uh, so this comes from Connor on Twitter, uh, not one of our friends of the show, Connor McGovern, um, but a different Connor. He tweeted back on March 30th of 2023, my way too early Mizzou football prediction upsets included. Pair with NY6 bowl game win and possible East championship dependent on UGA's performance Fellas, he got the schedule exactly right to date. Uh, obviously, the Arkansas game still to come. He did predict a win over Arkansas, but he has Mizzou. He had Mizzou finishing at ten and two with losses to LSU and to Georgia. So credit to Connor. I know football schedule can maybe be a little bit easier, but I don't think if you had asked any of us uh, preseason, none of us would have told you um, ten and two. It's literally just this guy and maybe SEC Mike, uh, who hosts the SEC After Dark show. Um, he predicted Mizzou to go 10 and 2 to his credit. But congrats to Connor. Um, would not have said this myself. So good for you. But way to keep your receipts. I um, picked seven and five. So <laughs> yeah, I think I picked I six and six. Off. Yeah. So well done, Connor. Way to have more faith. Uh, then I have one more bonus best thing I learned. This has been a story for like a little while now. Um, but the other best thing I learned goes to Aaron Matson. Who is Aaron Matson, you might say? Um, she's the coach of North Carolina's field hockey team. Now, what did North Carolina's field hockey team do? They won a national championship. All right, teams do that. Um, Erin Matson is 23 years old and just came off of her senior season as a player last year where she won four national championships. So I just think this is a wild story. She's 23 years old, given the head coaching duties of the best team in America and took them back to a title. So she now has five, four as a player, one as the head coach uh, and is literally as old as as the three of us basically so doing way more than we probably could so i had to give her some some props because that's just a wild story she was a freshman when we were a freshman and she's now a <laughs> national championship winning coach that's as pretty coach. remarkable it's pretty cool. i um i went one for one and had two put outs 
in a softball game on Sunday. I mean, we're going to talk about our accomplishments. <laughs> athletic feats. I mean, come on. I had two put outs in right field. Just easy catches. <laughs> no one wanted to run on me either. I just <laughs> lasers to home. Lasers. Well done. Watch Kenny. out. Well done. Yeah, but uh, congrats to Aaron Matson. That's a that's a dope story, and uh, yeah, it makes us feel all very unaccomplished. So thanks for that. Um, anyway, with that, we will uh, we'll end the show. Peyton, you got a joke for us? I didn't have one on hand. No, I don't care. That's you got to always have one on hand. Okay, let's go back to the the old reliable TV show, the Today Show. Um, oh yeah, all right. Joke. I want to end Thanksgiving uh, show on a joke. Yeah, sure, we can do that um here we go today.com uh the for, the obviously very famous tv show great tv uh, show great, great program. series um yep. been running for a long time oh here's a good one <laughs> when is a door got what guys when is a do- guys when is a door not a door when it's a wall when it's a jar when it's a jar <laughs> Oh, good one. That's good. Ooh, thank you to the Today Show. We love your uh, your episodes. Yeah, your your series is very that good. Story line with gets... Al, that storyline with Al Roker is top notch. What season are we on with the Today Show? Like, they, Hopefully they get greenlit for another season. You have to be in the 40s or something. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, this well, isn't funny. Go. Also... Development. Of Hoda is just remarkable. Yeah, she's a great character. Oh my gosh. I'm, I just want to say, I want to let the people know, I'm going to be on the Today Show on December 18th. So look out for me. I, maybe I'll make a sign that says, hello, Missouri. I don't know. We'll, we'll think about it. But I, I will be on the Today be Show cool, on December actually. 18th. You, will, you actually are going to be. I thought you were lying at first. But... <laughs> well, you can tell them what a great job they do with their with their episodes. I, I mean... Maybe Listen, the dude, after set plays. I'm done. It's not. It's not a TV I show. Mean, I'm done with it. This is dumb. Lines? What are your lines? <laughs> are you an extra? Why are they bringing you on? That's pretty cool. Kenny's gonna be like, hold up. Ho- Who, who's line, that directed by? Line, <laughs> Kenny's line not please. Left. This isn't the first time Kenny has left the the show. Or was that you that walked Shoot out him. the door? He's turn it off. Shoot him. You know what? Stop. There's Kenny's dogs. All right. We'll end the show. Everyone go enjoy your Thanksgiving. We'll be back uh, on Friday night to recap the Arkansas game and then Monday for uh, another full show for you guys. But everyone have a fun, happy, safe Thanksgiving and holiday season. We'll see you guys on Friday. Bye-bye.